video. Uh, this is the Vermont State College board meeting on March 27th. Um, the full board will be here. We'll have a full report today. Uh, I'm going to start and call the meeting to order and ask for the approval of the minutes from February 22nd. Do I hear a motion? Mary Moran has a motion. Um, do I have a second? Adam will second that. Okay, Adam seconds that. So we have a motion on the floor and a second for to accept the minutes of February 22nd. Um, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, good. Uh, one housekeeping note. Um, the link to sign up to provide public comments available on the agenda published on the VSC website or the link posted in the chat. And we're going to change the agenda just slightly. The past two budget update, which is an item 9B, will be discussed as part of the legislative update, which is actually agenda item number eight. That's something that uh, the CFO will go over with us. Um, now we're gonna get started on the presentation on our, on our um, board's responsibilities and authority. Um, there is an article in our materials from Jim Page and Barbara Brittingham that was governing higher education system in perilous times assessing the board's readiness and a capacity for strategic change. It was a very good article. I hope everyone had a chance to read it. I'd like to welcome Jim Page, who is our consultant that we that the state has hired and that we have also been using during the course of this transformation process and, and study. And uh, I'm gonna turn the meeting over now to our general counsel, Patty Turley and the chancellor, Sophie Zadotny to present what um, what they have re re worked on with uh, Jim Page and which will go through a variety of materials. Um, we will have questions and answers at the end and Jim Page will not be presenting, but he will be available for comment or to answer any questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the chancellor and the general counsel. I'm gonna turn it over to Patty to get it going. <laughs> go Patty. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen. Okay, uh, if I can make sure, Sophie, if you can nod, can you see that? Okay, good, thank you. So yes, thank you Chair Dickinson for introducing this uh, important topic. We are going to work today on making sure that the board has a good understanding of the authority of the trustees and how to locate the different responsibilities uh, within the Vermont State College system. So our very first, um, the establishment of board authority uh, and the locating of the board responsibilities are the, the overview for this, uh, for this presentation. And what you'll find is that the board's authority cascades down to the chancellor and to the presidents. Uh, the primary source of authority is indeed the statute. We are a, um, we are created by statute, so the legislature can also change our purposes and powers. Uh, emphasized within the, this portion of the statute that's in front of you is uh, the underlined uh, version that says, the corporation shall plan, supervise, administer, and operate facilities for education at the post-secondary level supported in whole or in substantial part with state funds. We know there is some movement in the legislature to address, address issues such as board makeup, more specific purposes and accountability. Um, uh, and so that may be on the horizon, but this is our statute as, as it's currently in place. The VSC is a public corporation, an instrumentality of the state and a government entity. That's, those are um, distinctions for the VSC. One, one thing we often hear is um, confusion about whether we are a 501c3 corporation 
or a nonprofit corporation, and we are not because of our public corporation status. The Board of Trustees uh, is described in the law, and of course, it, you, you are the trustee, so I'm sure you're aware that there are 15 of you appointed or elected as defined in the statute. There was a change to the statute, as you well know, in the past few years to uh, create the board appointed uh, uh, trustees. The governance of the board is, um, this is an interesting aspect for you to keep in mind. The board acts as a full board. Uh, you are not 15 individual cons, you know, trustees with distinct constituencies. You don't represent a region or a, um, a specific voice of, um, of, of, the, of, of a constituency. The board members are officers of the whole system. They have a, you have a fiduciary duty of care and a fiduciary duty of loyalty. Now, uh, the trustee handbook provides us with a little bit more information about what does it mean to have the standard of care. And some of you have been through the trainings on conflict of interest and duty. Uh, so only a brief reminder here is that a trustee shall at all times discharge duties as a trustee in good faith with the care an ordinarily prudent person in a like position would exercise under similar circumstances and in a manner the trustee reasonably believes to be in the best interests of the system. Loyalty is another concept uh, that the trustee handbook has defined and the, the, a trustee may challenge the judgment of others when he or she deems it necessary to do so and shall vote individual convictions after listening to others, but must be willing to work with board members in the best interests of the system. Uh, a final um, note here is that the board members, as part of these fiduciary duties, they also are to maintain confidentiality of executive sessions. They are to support the chancellor's role as our chief executive to whom the board has delegated authority. And um, the chancellor uh, is the spokesperson for the system while the chair is the spokesperson for the board unless otherwise delegated. The power of the board is also set out in, in the statute. Uh, and so it is here, but you don't have to uh, read it too closely because we're going to separate it out in these next slides. Uh, some of the specific powers that the board has from the statute are to confer degrees and honors, to appoint a chancellor, to appoint presidents of each institution, and to set out their duties, salaries, and terms of office. So that comes straight from the statute. And, and in addition, in the statute, uh, the board has the powers to make bylaws and regulate the governance of its meetings and the governance of its institutions. Now, this, this last part is interesting because it, it provides some additional uh, detail within the statute. The terms of student admissions is, is actually a board power, as is courses of instruction, courses, of uh, educational standards, rates of tuition, and scholarships and other student aids. So uh, that sounds great. It's in the statute, but what does that mean? How do we put it into practice? Well, the board uh, makes policies and, uh, and, and implements practices, and it does so in accordance with Vermont's open meeting law. And that means that we have, just as we are doing, we have agendas that are warned ahead of time and people have an opportunity to observe and attend and comment. And the, bo the board votes on its policies in the public meeting. The board adopts policies for impl implementation, but it's the chancellor who puts them into practice. Uh, the trustees don't have individual power or authority within, within, this, uh, within this framework. So the, the powers reside with the full board to, to make policy. 
and the, the um, and then management uh, has to uh, guide the board and um, and uh, inform the board and implement what the board puts into into place. Later in this presentation, we'll discuss in more detail that management is generally responsible for development and execution of strategy, selection and supervision of staff, development recommendation to the board and implementation of the budget and the establishment of procedures. Transformation is the reason that we're doing this presentation because it will make demands on the board as well as the system uh, to, to make decisions. We're always making decisions, but probably a lot more decisions are ahead of us right now. And so one of the reasons for this presentation is to make sure we understand who makes these decisions. The legislature, the board of trustees, the chancellor, the presidents or others. Uh, the legislature, for example, by statute has the power to close an institution. We do not, the board does not, and the system does not. If the General Assembly does decide to abandon lease or sell any of the institutions, it must work with the agency of administration to determine that action and obtain the approval of the governor. So they're also constrained. Uh, the state of Vermont is supposed to support and maintain the corporation in whole or in substantial part with state funds. That's why the legislature is involved in, 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 our, in our funding. And we've already discussed the board's authority uh, in the previous slide. So now I'm going to look at the chancellor's authority. The role of the chancellor um, is really uh, the chief executive officer. That's, that's the best way to describe the role of the chancellor uh, with the responsibilities and authority that comes with that position. The a chancellor is appointed by the board and serves at the pleasure by the board of the board unless the terms are otherwise designated by the board. The board conducts an annual performance review of the chancellor and the chancellor appoints the chief financial officer. That is the only other officer of the corporation um, outside the trustees and the chancellor. Um, and that person uh, who happens to be Sharon Scott is appointed by the chancellor. Um, the personal handbook uh, provides some additional information about the chancellor's duties. The chancellor has full discretion to add, modify, delete, or otherwise change unilaterally the provisions of the handbook. So that is a personnel handbook or the policies and procedures on which they are based at any time. The chancellor also is the hiring official in the chancellor's office. The president's are the hiring officials for each member institution, but they must consult with the chancellor before not reappointing or discharging an employee. The chancellor makes final decisions on requests for reclassifications. Again, that's a, about personnel. And the chancellor is the final decision maker on non-bargaining unit, non-union uh, non, uh, employee complaints and is the penultimate decision maker on grievances filed by bargaining unit employees. Next, we're gonna look at the role of the president. The role of the president is as the chief executive and administrator officer of the member institution. The board selects presidents, but consults with the chancellor and faculty, staff and students first. Uh, the president has direct responsibility uh, to the chancellor for the effective operation of the institution and for um, abiding by the policies and objectives approved by the board. And the chancellor exercises immediate supervision over the president. Our bylaws make it clear that the chancellor makes recommendations to the board on compensation, reappointment, non-appointment and discharge of presidents. And the um, it is the board that after considering the chancellor's recommendations and its own assessments of a president's performance has final authority. So the board does have final authority um, 
with respect to the, the president's performance and whether to reappoint or discharge. The chancellor does have the authority to suspend a president with pay in cases of a potential discharge before the board has had an opportunity to consider. The presidents are hiring officials for each member institution, but they do consult with the chancellor before not reappointing an employee or discharging an employee as I, I previously described. So most of these roles are quite familiar to you. Uh, we were more digging down into why we have those roles and I'm gonna hand this over to Sophie for the remainder of the presentation. All right, so the next slide um, shows the loc locating different levels of authority. So and as, as Patty has indicated, the highest level of authority is our authorizing statute that's uh, written into law. The next level of authority are our bylaws and the resolutions that the board passes. And then under that, we have the board policies. So under our bylaws, uh, they provide that the board may establish committees by resolution uh, that each committee of the board shall have the powers set forth in the resolution that established the committee. Uh, the charters for the board's committees are set forth in the trustee handbook and we're going to be talking about a new charter coming up here shortly. Uh, generally, the charters provide for the purpose of each committee, its organization, its responsibilities and its duties. And much of the work of the board is conducted by committees. Uh, and it's been a little bit different this past year, given the situation we've been in, a lot of work has actually been conducted directly by the board, but historically much of the work is conducted by the committees. Um, and typically it's, it's considered good practice to follow a committee's recommendation, unless there's a compelling reason not to do so. Uh, basically, you don't want to have the board redoing the work that's already been done in committee and trustees that don't sit on a particular committee should be comfortable with that an appropriate and adequate process was followed at the committee level. The next few slides are looking in more detail at certain aspects of the board's responsibilities. I appreciate how tiny the writing is on here. We will pr be providing these slides um, to you afterwards. They'll be, they'll be available. Um, so just looking at a number of different areas. So strategic planning, for example, in this slide, we just run through what the statutory authority is, where, where in the bylaws it's mentioned, the trustee handbook, the VSC pol uh, policies, and then if there are other authorities, um, rules, regulations, et cetera, put those in the end column. So, uh, so you have a sense of you know, how, this, how these things come into play. So the board does play a critical role in defining the mission, vision, and strategic priorities of the Vermont State College system as well as overseeing and approving the strategic plans of the individual institutions to ensure that those plans are consistent with the system. And this is one of the board's most important roles. Under our current policy, which is policy 505, the board reviews the mission, vision and strategic priorities every three years for the system. And the chancellor has responsibility for updating system priorities at appropriate intervals and presenting any revisions to the Long Range Planning Committee for review, who then forwards it on to the board for final approval. And we did just go through the strategic priorities um, in the fall. At the institutional level, each president shall establish an institution specific strategic planning process that includes both short term and long term planning. And all revisions to the institution's mission and vision statements are reviewed by the Long Range Planning Committee and then forwarded the board for final approval. By policy, the chancellor and the presidents are to report annually to Long Range Planning Committee on the progress of strategies and objectives as outlined both in the system and institutional strategic plans. So this is important to bear in mind because we obviously will be thinking about the uh, mission, vision and strategic priorities of the, the to be created um, new entity that's going to come out of the, the common accreditation of um, Northern Vermont University, Castleton University and Vermont Technical College. So that's an important role that the board has in front of it. Turning to the next slide, we're looking at academic pro programs and policies. And again, the statutory authority, um, as noted, the board explicitly it, by statute has authority to prescribe courses of instruction and educational standards. And then again, there's um, information in the bylaws, the, the trustee handbook, a variety of policies, which I know the EPSL committee is familiar with, as well as other sources here. So we have both 
um, information in our full-time faculty collective bargaining agreement regarding faculty governance, shared governance over academic programs, and then also NETCHI, the New England Commission on Higher Education. These are the standards, the accreditation standards that we have to abide by and standard um, four talks about the academic program. There's also standard 3.15, which I didn't add on here from NETCHI, which states that the institution places primary responsibility for the content, quality, and effectiveness of the curriculum with its faculty. So again, the faculty do play an important role with regard to academic programs. Um, and according to policy, uh, new degrees and majors require approval by the board, that's policy 102. Existing programs are reviewed annually by presidents for enrollment, retention, graduation, and cost. And the presidents then present any rationale for closure of any program to the chancellor. The chancellor provides recommendations to EPSL regarding program closures, which are then voted on by the full board. And that's policy 109. Um, the other key policy that I just wanted to flag for you here was also policy 101, which is called PRECIP, the Program Review and Continuous Improvement Process. And that policy provides for an annual review of four to six disciplines annually to ensure quality and relevance. And all programs should be going through that cycle um, but at least once every five years. Other examples of academic uh, policies that uh, the board has considered, um, I'm just thinking of one recently, which was the policy on classroom recordings. Um, so for example, that was a concern that was raised about potential violations of FERPA, which is the, the Privacy Act governing student records in connection with recordings of classes. Uh, that concern was raised at the campus level and there was a recognition that there needed to be a consistent approach system-wide. So a policy was drafted, shared with internal stakeholders and then revised based upon input received, it was approved by the chancellor and the council of presidents, considered by the EPSL committee and then forwarded to the full board for final approval as a new board policy. And that's policy one, uh, 112. I just reflect that because it just gives you an example of sort of how policies come, come into being. On the next slide, uh, we've got laid out uh, the financial policies uh, broken down into two slides. The first one talks about budget and resource allocation. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these in minute detail, but the chancellor essentially recommends a system-wide budget to the board of trustees annually. And the board is responsible for understanding, reviewing, approving, and monitoring compliance. And I do want to emphasize that um, NECI changed their standards at the beginning of this year. And one of the um, revisions to their standards was in standard 7.7, .7, where they emphasized <clears throat> that the board, the governing board has to understand the um, institution's financial plans um, before they just had to review and approve. But now there's actually an expectation that the board understands as well, uh, the financial planning. Uh, the board also has the authority to shift resources if needed. Again, we, we have a resource allocation policy under 403. Um, I'm not going to go through all the individual policies in great detail here, but again, the board approves the annual operating budget over three passes, uh, beginning early each calendar year, um, and we're, we're going to be talking about the second pass of the budget later on in this meeting. Uh, the board, um, also the chief financial officer, is responsible for directing and supervising all financial and business affairs of the corporation and the CFO and, the, and her team serve as the treasury officer and oversee all cash management functions. Again, their work is governed by board policies. And the board, as mentioned before, does approve um, tuition and fees. So the institutions propose tuition fee room and board rates to the board of trustees annually. The board typically approves not to exceed maximum rates for these values. And then the institutions are responsible for setting financial aid in consultation with the chancellor that supports the overall strategic goals of the VSC regarding affordability and accessibility. Discount provisions for each institution must be established within the confines of the system-wide and institutional budgets. So the second financial policy slide talks about capital expenditures and debt instruments. And again, annually state funded capital projects are, are proposed to the board of trustees Typically, those capital projects uh, relate to health, life safety, accessibility, and other major maintenance. And decisions regarding the purchase, sale, or disposal of facilities 
are also the responsibility of the Board of Trustees with a recommendation from the Chancellor. Uh, decisions regarding the issuance of or refinancing of debt instruments is the responsibility of the Board of Trustees upon recommendation of the Chancellor. And again, we have a host of policies that relate to these. And I, I think you're all fairly familiar with, with these pieces, particularly sale of real estate. Um, but I know finance and facilities addresses a number of these different policies. And we can certainly talk about them in more detail if there are questions. Uh, finally, administrative policies. So we have a host of administrative policies. Uh, these are set out in the different, um, the board policies are, numbered and so there's a, a numbering um, guidance in terms of 100 is academic and 200 is students and etc 400 is financial so throughout the the policies there are a number of administrative policies uh, at those different levels and some of the ones i've highlighted here are for example are policy 207 and 210 that deal with conflicts of interest both for officers and trustees as well as for employees Policy 211, our whistleblower policy, and then of course ones that you're, you're quite familiar with because we're often coming to the board to discuss them. Policy 311 and 311A relating to discrimination, harassment, sexual assault, and then the new policy uh, 316 that came into effect, uh, I think about a year or so ago, which related to um, protection of minors on campus. And again, typically administrative policies are drafted at the chancellor's office. Uh, they're drafted in response to an issue, problem, or change in the law that has been identified by the board, uh, the chancellor's office, or college personnel. Policies are review, reviewed and revised by appropriate internal stakeholders before they're finalized and submitted to the applicable board committee for approval. Uh, the administrative policies really are, are intended to make sure the system is in compliance with laws and regulations and also that there are consistent policies and practices between the institutions on key matters. Uh, terms of employment um, are actually largely governed by collective bargaining agreements or the personnel handbook. Um, so again, we've, we've got some examples that we can discuss, um, but just touch on briefly, you know, Title IX, when the Trump administration issued new, new regulations governing how campus sexual assaults were to be handled, the Office of General Counsel drafted revised policies and procedures last summer with the assistance of outside counsel. Uh, we, we provided those to internal stakeholders and then they came to the board for approval. Um, ordinarily, they would have gone to EPSL first, but there was insufficient time given um, the date, uh, the implementation date that was required by the, the regulations. Um, the protection of minors and mandatory reporting of child abuse and neglect, uh, policy 216, that was created really in response to a demand from our insurance company, United Educators, based on what was happening um, across the country, you know, scandals regarding Larry Nasser, Jerry Sandusky and other ones. So that was a, a, an example of a policy that was created due to an outside uh, request. Um, another one was the recent tobacco use reduction and prevention policy. And that was created as a result of a request from the Vermont Commissioner of Health uh, we had a, a presentation to the EPSL committee and the board uh, directed that a policy be created and the chancellor's office drafted a policy and we passed that. Um, again, just to sort of think through how all these things work, for example, on that particular policy, once it had been passed, we did have one of the bargaining units requested to impact bargain over the policy, uh, given that it affected the working conditions of employees. So that these things do go hand in hand. Uh, there is also our, our bargaining units to consider as we think through these things. So finally, um, just on a final note, uh, the board is the Vermont State College System's sole fiduciary. And although the board may delegate responsibilities to the chancellor, the presidents, faculty and staff, the board does retain the final authority to plan, supervise, administer and operate facilities for education at the Vermont State Colleges. And that's pretty broad um, authority that's being provided by the legislature. I do want to flag that, you know, I think this language has been in there since the 1960s. Um, it is my expectation based on the work that's been done by the select committee that um, it's likely that the legislature will take another look at our enabling statute next legislative ses session in uh, next January. And I wouldn't be surprised if there were some changes made to that statute regarding um, what the expectations are for the Vermont State Colleges and also for the board. So 
Um, if that happens, obviously we'll be updating you on that. Um, in terms of fiduciary duty, just to touch on that, I mean, being a fiduciary means being a steward of public trust, acting in the best interest of the organization, not in the best interest, obviously, of individual trustees. And as, as Patty has noted, uh, trustees need to exercise reasonable care in all their decision making without placing the organization under unnecessary risk. So that is our presentation. Um, I do understand there's gonna be additional training for the board coming up um, on a number of areas, including strategic planning, um, board culture, shared governance, and also uh, labor negotiations. So, uh, but if there are any questions, uh, Patty and I, I'm sure would be more than happy to, to answer those. And Jim, I'm sure will be available too if folks have other questions. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you to Patty and Turley. Are there any questions on any of this? There's a lot there. And again, just so you didn't have to scribble everything down, we certainly will be making it available <laughs> to you so you can digest it more slowly. Okay, we'll start with Megan and then go to Bill Lippert. Excellent, thanks. And I, I had a question. Um, Patty, when you were going through towards the end of your section, you talked about four bullets of board responsibility, and one of them was course of instruction. And I think there was another piece in there about quality. And then Sophie, later in the discussion, you talked about and emphasized the faculty role in setting course of instruction and overseeing quality. And I would just, I'd love to better understand the interplay of how those authorities work together and are there clear lines that we can look to? If you can just talk a little bit about the, uh, those two areas. I, I mean, I can just, I mean, so under our accreditation standards, there is an expectation obviously that faculty play a role in the content quality and effectiveness of the curriculum. Um, but also the board does have explicitly in statute that it gets to uh, has authority over courses to prescribe courses of instruction and educational standards. So there is some tension there. Um, under our collective bargaining agreement with the full-time faculty contract, the president has final determining authority on um, curriculum issues and um, but has to consult with the faculty assembly. So I think there is there is a way to address this um, as we as we move through, um, you know, looking ahead. I think and my understanding, and again, I'm happy to have Jim weigh in on this as well. Um, but you know, the board can set direction, can set expectations for things. Um, for example, the board did charge um, the colleges in terms of general education. That work came out of the BSCS Forward Task Force. So sort of said, yes, that recommendation that the VSCS Forward Task Force came forward with on creating um, a common general education core, the board said, yes, we accept that recommendation and then sort of then turned it back to the colleges to do it. And I know we've Yasmin on here. Yasmin can probably talk through um, sort of how that process has worked. So I think there's a way these two pieces come together. So Yasmin, are you comfortable just explaining how that works? Certainly, I think that's a, that's a great example that uh, Megan, I think addresses your question, right? The board ultimately charged that this work happened and directed the chancellor then who in turn uh, delegated to me. And, and the next step there for me was really to convene a group of faculty across um, the colleges and they have been the ones to say, okay, how do we most effectively do a general education core? They've designed the learning outcomes. They're in the process of, um, getting feedback from their colleagues on it. So that's, and, and, and ultimately those, the new proposal is, is right now uh, before faculty assemblies for final approval. So that's, that's how that works. Anything else on that? Okay, we have Bill Lippert followed by Jim Maslin. You're muted, Jim, uh, Bill. Uh, so interestingly enough, I have two questions, but interestingly enough, the first question I had uh, touches on the exactly, uh, or some of the same areas that Megan was raising, which as I was listening, uh, and as I read uh, the article that was shared, uh, one of the comments was that 
the board should have a regular, should have a relationship with its accrediting body, uh, which is Nechi for us. And I have to say that I, that's, we can, we'll talk about those gaps later. Uh, but uh, one of the things that struck me as I, as I listened to this, I said, thought to myself, well, what's the relationship between uh, the board and quote, the academy as such, as it's often referred to, i.e. the, you know, the faculty, the, the role of, of, of faculty, et cetera. And it struck me that part of that is actually defined through the accreditation process, which is what you're, I think, pointing to as well, that the credit, that we have to have an accreditation and the accreditation has standards and the standards require uh, engagement with faculty uh, in some manner. And I, I think that's something that is, has been less explicit in my experience uh, and is helpful to be thinking about. Uh, and the examples that you, you, you just put forward are, I think, helpful and I think will be helpful to think further. So I, I, I just wanted to note that I, that I think the relationship between accreditation, the standards for accreditation and the board's authority are important to begin to understand more fully as well. The, uh, the, sec the second, uh, comment uh, or observation is that um, there's, a, there's a saying within the world of, leg the leg of legislating that uh, policy is really uh, stated by where you put your money. <laughs> and uh, I mean, if you don't, you know, money is, money is really the explicit statement of policy. And, uh, and the idea that we set policy as the board for everything about the state colleges system uh, is in fact on paper accurate, but when it push comes to shove, the people who provide us with the money, i.e. the legislature and the governor, the executive branch, and I think it's very important that we not just think it's the legislature, uh, which is a really misnomer that's been used so often in this process. It's, it's the executive branch and the legislature together, which uh, put the money in place for the system. Uh, and that ultimately uh, they, they, I'm speaking of them, not as, you know, the legislature, the legislative branch and the executive branch have full authority to set all kinds of policy and they do so uh, through the appropriation of funds and conditions and stand and statements that are attached to those funds. And so I think there's, there's, there's often this, the formal authority of the board and then understanding what the actual authority of the board is at times. And maybe that's a bigger discussion with Jim Page and others at some point in time. But I think uh, it's just an observation that I see regularly happening uh, within the world of appropriation of money. Any comments? I would just add, uh, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but um, I mean, Bill is correct. In terms of the budget right now, there are there is language associated with the, the budget bill um, relating to expectations for, uh, you know, for the Vermont State Colleges as a sort of quid pro quo for getting the money. So um, that is something to be remembered that um, we, we do have uh, the, the, the state that's funding us also gets to sort of tell us what, what it expects from us as well. And, and, and just in that really larger uh, perspective to recognize that is not unique to the Vermont State Colleges. I believe me, <laughs> as we've just approved the general, the budget over the last few days, uh, there are many places in which the, uh, the legislature and the executive branch together uh, appropriate dollars, but within a certain condition, uh, because in fact, it's the public's money. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. I think the other group of people who have a lot to say about our policies and our courses and all sorts of things involved with what we do are the students and their families and the people who actually pay the tuition. And they speak, they, they vote with their feet. They go where they're gonna go, they're gonna do what they're gonna do. And um, we have a fiduciary responsibility to listen to them as well. I don't know what the percentage is, but I suspect it's mostly the students who have the uh, 
money policy uh, partnership we have here at the moment, although the state is certainly trying to improve on that. Um, Jim Maslin, followed by Adam Grinnell. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, Sophie and Chancellor's office, this has been an excellent presentation, um, explicitly clear and linear, which some of us like. It all makes very good sense. Um, I have some comments about the role of EPSL, which I offer as sort of hold harmless comments, what may, may very well be useful, um, which go as follows. When before we, the state colleges, sorry about the cat, um, before the state colleges hit the wall financially and with regards to um, COVID, um, the role of EPSL was pretty simple. Um, we were largely approving um, new courses and degrees, whatnot, brought forth by the various um, institutions. And it was pretty easy work. Um, now it's clear, I think, even though we haven't said so explicitly, that which, which, which courses are offered, which may be cut, um, what the degrees turn out to be going forward becomes far more important. And while EPSL, EPSL could participate more directly in that discussion, that's not what EPSL is, is doing, I don't think. And um, as I said, I offer these comments home, hold harmless, um, but I was mildly frustrated from time to time and spoke to um, Megan about that, about the fact that um, EPSL hasn't, hasn't been used, shall we put that uh, in that terms, as um, use usefully, hasn't been used as programmatically usefully um, as might be helpful. Um, to, to change the role of EPSL much without changing the statutes and our bylaws, those are all perfectly clear, would involve, I think, conversations between EPSL, Chancellor's Office, and the college presidents about where are you going uh, and whatnot. And generally, or completely, um, at, at um, trustees meetings, we all get to see the sweep of where we're heading, but many of us don't participate in ways that might be helpful if, the, if we had a format, a structure for that sort of participation. In, um, we know what kind of jam we're in right now. And we also know that the, um, the larger the committee, the longer it takes to decide anything. But I think that to reiterate and then pipe down, um, th there may be a larger role for EPSL if we can decide how to do that most functionally. And um, I think that that may be um, helpful for the, for the chancellor's office. It might be helpful for the presidents and it also might be helpful as we try within our own constituency or, or out and about to articulate where the state colleges are heading and how we're going to address that. Most of the most of the what we've been talking about lately, as Bill is very, very well, have been financial matters. But really, we're talking about educated Vermonters for the next several generations. And that's the bottom line, particularly for me, and I hope for all of us. So thank you for listening. Any comments? Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, Adam Grinault. Yeah, thank you. So really following up on Jim, I, I was taking notes. So I'm not sure if it was policy 305 or maybe 101 where um, you referenced Sophie, uh, I believe it was in your presentation, uh, going back every year and, and pulling forward three to five programs for just sort of an audit or review for alignment and value. So I'm curious, is that a practice that we've been doing? And if so, are there actions or results that have come from that that would either grow or shrink or make some modification? I'm just curious sort of our past practices and if we envision doing that somewhat differently, if so. Yeah, we certainly have been doing it, but I would let Yasmin chime in because I think it might have been, we did not do as complete um, a precept review this past year given COVID, but I, Yasmin may have more information on that from the EPSL committee. Sure, it, it's true that we, we have um, revised things just a little bit for this year with COVID, but actually the five-year cycle that Sophie mentioned earlier, it is policy 101, that's our continuous improvement process. And 
all programs go through that. So on a five-year cycle, they're reporting on what did they learn from their last analysis of, of how students are doing in their programs? What adjustments have they made to improve on those outcomes? Um, and and that's, that's what goes into that five-year review. So I think we regularly see programs making changes to curriculum. Um, for example, uh, a lot of work recently in implementing more um, hands-on learning experiences, capstone experiences, making sure students are really exiting programs prepared. I think that's been a big um, push in many of our programs. So the, the real specifics come out in those, in those reviews and we do have external um, members sitting on those review committees to have a, a dialogue with the program leadership about those. Yeah. Thank you. Jasmine, can you explain a little bit more about those external people sitting on those committees? Who so, are they or what are they? Sure. So the, the committees are, are comprised of peers. So if we're doing psychology, for example, last year had faculty from each of the psychology programs across the system. Um, and then we might look to a graduate program faculty member to serve on. We might look to a employer who would be hiring uh, graduates coming out. So it's, it's typically um, that kind of mix of external, external members. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, Lynn? Yes, Mary. Not questions. I'm having significant difficulty with my connection today and Jen's been helping me. So I wonder when we finish the next section, if I could give the two reports that I have input on in case I kept getting bounced off. Yeah, we can do that. Um, sometimes it helps if you turn off your video and you keep your sound on. I'm not sure if that uh, will help, but that does sometimes help. Um, one of the things I want to ask is that uh, these are our legal statutory things. These are the things that we have in our policies. The next part would be what has been our practice in the past? Um, can someone describe? We talked a little tiny bit about it, but uh, uh, Bill, do you want to say something first? Uh, yeah, without, I, I just want to name, yeah, we just want to name an issue that uh, as we were listening to the formal role and uh, authority of the board under the statutes, uh, and it, it references our role with regard to institutions and presidents, the board's relationship through the chancellor to the presidents and the institutions, and that, um, and I think as we think, as, we, as we're looking ahead and thinking in terms of the transformation process that is underway and set in motion, that we are trans, that the, again, the accreditation process is going to move us as uh, from a structure with uh, institutions with multiple presidents, at least three is what's, what's in place and in, pro in process to a president of that singly accredited institution, mm -hmm. as well as a president of the community college of Vermont. Mm -hmm. So there will still be the relationship of presidents to the chancellor and to the board. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting again, to think in terms of where the authority lies to transform through the accreditation changes that we have set in motion. Uh, that it's not the closure of an institution, but it's in fact the transformation of three institutions into a single accreditation, um, which I think is to say one institution. I mean, I just want to make sure that we all appreciate and understand. I mean, I, I know we're, we know where we're going in, in that sense, but it's, but it, it fits within our, it fits within our structure, but it's uh, a different, again, accreditation is a part of what is driving uh, and responding to what our needs are. Uh, okay, thank you. And, um, Sophie, I don't know whether, whether we want the chancellor or Yasmin or Jim Page or 
there have been practices in the past that have not necessarily lined up with our policies? Is this something we need to, I mean, it seems like the select group had a, a series of comments in their, in their reports that talked about this. Um, Megan, yeah, I, people yeah, who the select group. Yeah, certainly the select committee recognized that, um, you know, the board has a lot of authority, but hasn't always exercised the amount of authority that it actually has. Um, the other piece, again, which we'll, we'll touch on um, in a little bit with the legislative update is one of the um, metrics or requirements that the legislature is looking to put on us is to make sure that we are following through that the, the policies and procedures are being followed um, and that if they're not being followed, there's a reason, you know, that there's a recognized, understood, um, documented reason why we're not following a particular policy at a particular time. So for example, we know that 403, the resource allocation piece and, and the, uh, was suspended last summer and there was a discussion about that and the decision about it, um, but that we're not sort of ignoring policy. So I think there definitely is a need for us to start going through the, the policy manual and making sure that we don't have, you know, I know we've got some policies in there that are from like 1979 and whatever, I have no idea if they're still in effect or, but I think it's probably worth um, us as um, working with the board, but to review uh, the current policy. And I, I know, for example, just off the top of my head, there's a policy regarding uh, CCV instructors. Well, that has now effectively been mooted by the CCV uh, contract, the union collective bargaining agreement contract, the CCV adjunct. So it's it's in effect a redundant policy at this point. So I think there is some work that can be done there to go through um, the different, you know, again, all the different levels, the, the different um, series of policies and just do an, an audit of them to see which ones perhaps need up, updating or maybe eliminating um, I think that definitely would be a valuable exercise for us to do again, time permitting, given everything else. But um, so I, I think there is an, a sense we haven't always uh, followed through. I did try to provide some examples of sort of how policies have come to be. Um, you know, I off the top of my head, um, you know, I'm sure their trustees have particular um, ones that are of concern. I think historically there's been concern about whether or not um, boards or committees have voted on particular things and has that actually happened so I think that's another piece as we move forward is making sure there's an accountability piece so if mm -hmm. if it's decided that certain programs are going to be um, closed for example that then there'd be a, a, a cycle back that okay you know at a follow-up meeting you know what, what's happening with that what's the status with it to make sure things are happening um, so I don't think there's been um, you know policies have been ignored um, explicitly, I just think that there hasn't been the sort of report back. And I think we all know, given how busy everything is, if you don't have a deadline or a reason to report back, you know, those things tend to sort of fall to the bottom of the list rather than staying as a top priority. So that would be one suggestion I have in terms of moving forward. Anyone else? Uh, Jim Page, you've been listening to this. Um, you wrote the article. Is there anything that you would like to add at this time? Uh, not really. I, uh, in talking with, uh, with the chancellor and the general counsel earlier, the, the goal was simply to establish a baseline of, uh, it, 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 the point was very well made by the general counsel who said, we're, we're undergoing a trans, we're entering a transformation. BSC is entering a transformation. Uh, it's imperative if that's going to work well that the, there be clarity around who needs to be at the table with what authority around the various decisions. And those are often uh, fairly complex, procedurally fa fairly complex, but it's important that the board know what the bottom line is in each of those. And I think that the presentation today it was, a, it was an excellent first step in, in making that clear. There will be details that emerge as, as the group gets into the real world exercise and they'll have to be looked at again and, and, and looked at in, in various uh, ways of refinement. But I think this has been an excellent, excellent start. Um, I really appreciated uh, uh, Bill's comments that, that, that the accreditors here are a, a group that uh, have an enormous amount of influence on how these, these pieces work. 
and uh, they are a uh, they are a partner uh, just de facto, but they can be a real strategic partner in helping through these changes. And I think the uh, system is well set up to uh, to engage with Nechi and with the individuals there to assist with that. Um, and I also take the point that I think Bill made again that uh, that this is transformation, but within a framework. Um, and the framework is is one that may evolve will evolve in terms of policies, in terms of what the legislative requirements might be or not. But uh, the framework is there and, uh, and, and has worked well for, very well for you over the last year. It's coming into its high test period now as you begin to implement your strategic changes. But I would be, uh, I'd be very uh, 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 optimistic uh, with how things, how your, your staff and team is setting this up and uh, how you'll approach these issues uh, very methodically, very logically, and very comprehensively in the coming weeks and months. So. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on that, but my basics is uh, well. My basic is well done. Thank you. Thank you to the chancellor and the general counsel. Bill. Um, I guess a little bit of apology for speaking so often, but I I feel like uh, in again in reviewing uh, the article that Jim and uh, Barbara wrote. Uh, Frankly, there were a couple of things that struck me that are not quite acknowledged in the article. And so I say this with appreciation for the article, but it just struck me that uh, it's, it starts from a point of view that there's the board. I've never seen a board that is static. Uh, and this board is certainly not, has not been static. Uh, there, every board is an evolving structure, is an evolving group and I think that speaks to the issue that it, it's, it's incumbent upon us as the board to bring new members into understanding all of what we just talked about and understanding what the, what the evolving um, agreements have been uh, amongst the board as new members come into the board. And in fairness to potential new members, uh, to brief them prior to accepting stepping into a board role. Uh, it, 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 anyway, at this, I, I think I, my point is that the board, the board membership is a dynamic process, mm -hmm. not a static process. And it's therefore not a static entity and requires some attention to those issues. Uh, and I, I say that again with appreciation because it came to my mind as I was reading and thinking about mm. uh, the, 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 the analysis and gap analysis and, and that. Um, so I, I, I just, and, and, then, and, and then it goes, it, I think attached to that is who gets to constitute the board? Uh, again, a, a key issue. Uh, if you in fact are thinking that the board that are not thinking, but if the board has certain important levels of authority at all these levels, then those who are appointing the board membership uh, have a very important role, which is not always articulated. Uh, uh, it seems to me it's not, not always fully articulated, stepping back and saying, well, what is the perspective of those, whether it's the board itself, now it's ourselves and it's the governor and it's the legislature. And I think those are kind of pre-existing uh, influences, which are very important to bring into the conversation as well. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have anything to add to this? Seeing, seeing no one else raising their hands here that I can see. Um, I'm going to move on. Mary has asked, I'm going to ask for an adjustment to the, um, the um, agenda. Um, instead of going into the executive committee item on the agenda, we're gonna go down to number, oh no, it's four, whatever the number is. Um, and Mary, I'm going to have you start, if you would. Yeah, I don't have an agenda in front of me because nothing's working. So what item is that? Okay, well, 
you're de- number five and we would next go to number four, which is the diversity. You're number five with the diversity, equity and inclusion committee. We had materials on the board from you, okay. from your committee. If you wanna give that report. Um, um, yeah, I think um, okay. I'm gonna do my best with, without any materials here. Um, and I also have the, um, the um, award, fellow award thing to report on. Yes. Um, so we had a very good meeting. Uh, Patty joined and uh, Yasmin was part of it. So if I lose connection, those guys can, can speak up. We, we talked about the, um, sorry, I'm trying to do this from memory. Um, we had um, Miles Smith and Jesse Ventura from NVU spoke about work that they're doing up there with a, um, a um, oh, I'm so sorry anti-racism pl- pledge and it was a really very good conversation and uh, they updated us with what's going on at NDU and um, very, very uh, impressive. And if anyone else who was on that meeting wants to speak, that would be, done, be fine. We talked about the inclusion and this is where Yasmin was helpful of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion language into the um, hiring process as well as into, I don't know what to call it, the, um, no. help me ask me, the um, uh, faculty. The, the general education requirements. The we general must... education requirements and those, the language was there. So the, I, the, 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 the conversation about adopting the charter or, or voting on the charter, they, uh, we, we, we uh, uh, decided or came to the conclusion that uh, would have to go to the faculties in May before it could be officially adopted. Yes, me, is that correct? Uh, again, for the general education, right? Yes. That's the consideration right. right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, anything else from anybody who was there that, that I may have missed? Um, Mary, if I may, just, just one piece uh, that I thought was interesting was, was also learning about some of the tech updates that were underway uh, oh, right. to make the, the backbone systems um, more reflective of uh, identities and so forth. So that's an ongoing conversation. I think we'll have more updates in the future, uh, but that was helpful to hear from the tech director and others. Thanks. Well, that was Doug Eastman, um, Dylan. So talked about um, gender identity and making the language in all of the VSC um, documents and materials be consistent and and correct. Megan, Dylan, okay. <laughs> uh, Jim. Um, thank you. Um, it was a good meeting that we had um, recently. Thefford Academy, which is our local designated high school uh, faculty and students came up with a policy that deals pretty much directly with the subject matter that we're talking about. And I will forward it to the board. It's, uh, it's not exactly or exactly linked to the direction that the committee and the students faculty are going, but I think you all might find it useful to read. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for your contribution to the meeting. It was very helpful. Yes, so we do have we do have a request for a motion and a vote on the proposed committee charter. This is the charter that we received in our materials. Um, we do have input for the general education requirements that will be approved or reviewed by the faculty. Uh, I think we can approve this charter ahead of that. Uh, do I hear any motions on approving the um, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee Charter. Given that, Lynn, I would make that motion, please. Okay, Mary Moran has made that motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Jim Maslin will second it. Okay, any further discussion on it? Um, I think the information in the, in the um, materials was actually very good. Any questions at all? Okay, all those in favor of approving the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee Charter as presented to us by that committee, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, Mary, now you had another thing you said you had to do. Um, the um, trustee. I keep losing, my, me. I keep losing my, my regular. Okay, were you the, under? 
it, it said that you were going to make a presentation. The, um, I'm, I'm losing what we call them, but the honor, the, the people that are being honored. Ah, uh, yes. Faculty yes. fellows. The faculty fellows, yes, there were only, yes. So we had a good meeting on that and those materials, those bios are in your materials. Yes. And um, we, have, we had um, Helen Mango, who was evidently not included timely last year that we approved. Helen's at Castleton since 1991. And in, I won't go through a lot of detail here, but in every, because you have their bios, in every case, these uh, faculty members are scholars, contributors, committee members, community service folks. They're practicing in their field and they're wonderful teachers as well as contributing on campus. So I could enumerate each one, but I think you have the materials there. So from last year, Helen Mango from Castleton, and this year, um, Inga Smith-Luce from Vermont Tech, uh, nursing and paramedic, and <clears throat> incredible uh, community contributions. And Pat Shine from Linden, AKA now NVU, um, I love one of the quotes from one of the, the recommendations. She is, quote, a really amazing instructor. And she also has been involved in many, many committees and service uh, on the issue of social justice. We did have a third nominee, which was a little, well, came in too late. And we would, we we're recommending that Jonathan bring that person forward next year. That's Christopher Betcher at Castleton. Mm -hmm. He as well had a very uh, impressive resume, but it came in after the process had been, uh, been completed. So I've read, we've, we've, the committee's recommended to Jonathan that if he agrees that uh, Chris should come forward next year. But having worked with some, I, I'm not personally familiar with any of these folks, but having worked with faculty members at BTC, Castleton and CCB, we have amazingly, talented faculty and who, as I said, they're not just qualified in their academic fields, they're wonderful teachers. The end. Okay, thank you, Mary. Any comments? Uh, this is part of the EPSL report. This was, um, this was just part of the EPSL report number six. Uh, Megan, do you have anything to add to this? I'm not gonna give the full, I don't have anything further to add in the faculty fellows other than thank you, Mary, for taking on this, um, important role and, and um, working through those nominations. Um, but I do you want me to give the full EPSL report? Uh, well, you could, you could. We could just go down and finish that. Um, uh, nobody has any need a motion. We do need a motion to uh, a motion approve to the faculty fellows. That's correct, yeah. yes. Yes, thank you very much on that. Yeah, so I need a motion for the approval of Helen Mango from Castleton University, Pat Shine from NVU, and Inga Smith Luce from VTC. Um, Karen? So moved. So moved. Karen is seconding that. Okay, any further discussion? Um, I, I thank the presidents and the people from the institutions for coming forward with this information and helping us. And I know some of these people are here to. Uh, I believe uh, Patricia Shine is here. Oh, anyone, any one of the candidates want to say something? Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I was actually going to put it in the chat. I want to thank you all very much um, for this honor and for supporting the work of social justice. Um, I'm really excited uh, to be working not only with NVU colleagues, but colleagues throughout the VSC. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Any, anyone else? Anyone from the presidents? Pat? Thank you. I just also quickly want to thank you very much for recognizing Inga Smith-Luce in this capacity. The work she's going to be doing around simulation, multi-discipline simulation is going to be really beneficial for the college. So thank you for giving her this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Elaine. Uh, I just wanted to say, to note how competitive this year's process was at NVU. There were multiple candidates, that is rare. And everyone, you know, I, I had to call people to talk about why I chose Pat as the person that we were moving forward. Everyone understood how important the work that she is about to do is for the system and for the university and, and just kind of wished us well and said they'd apply uh, in a following year. So I thought that spoke highly of uh, Pat's respect on campus and the work that she's doing. 
And lastly, I can just affirm uh, from a personal level that I've attended book groups that Pat has coordinated, restorative justice circles, and also diversity training, and it is absolutely top notch. So I thank Pat for the work, and I thank you so much for recognizing it. Thank you. Thank you. How about you, Jonathan? You're from Castleton. Thank you, Lynn, so much. Um, Mary kind of uh, alluded to the fact that we evaluate faculty really on three indices. There's teaching, there's scholarship, and there's service. And all three of these nominees are just so terrific. And uh, I rise to speak for Helen Mango at Caston. She just uh, gives and gives and gives to the university and to the students of Vermont. She's universally beloved on our campus. Mm -hmm. I might note that she's also never shy about telling me what to do. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. She's just very deserving of this recognition. So thank you, Mary. Thank you, the committee. And thank you, Lynn, for allowing us to recognize these, these really great, great members of our system. Well, thank you to the committee and everyone involved. OK, thank you. Now, we will go to number six, which is the EPSL. And uh, Megan, you can start with that. Sure, thanks, Lynn. And just to report out quickly, the only action item we had for the board was um, the uh, approval of those and ratification of those faculty fellows, um, which actually, Lynn, I'm sorry, did we close? Did we just take a vote on that? Or I'm sorry. We... No, we didn't. No, but thank you very much. Good reminder. So we have a motion on the floor. We've had um, a second. Um, any further discussion? Um, hearing none, we will have a vote on the uh, acceptance of these three uh, faculty fellows. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the faculty fellows are acknowledged. Okay, Megan, go ahead. Now, this is mostly what I understand is the RPK group's report. Yes, I just wanted to cover off quickly on three, just to make the board aware, three topics that we've been focused on. Um, so the, the committee has been discussing data dashboards and uh, metrics and KPIs, and I think you'll hear how those continue to tie into the work of the overall board. And um, I think some of the discussion that happened at the committee meeting, you'll hear it, even in, in Sophie's report out, we're starting to um, pull together with, with the broader metrics we're looking at. But really, um, Jim, to your point, of thinking about that role of EPSL going forward. And Jim, I pre have appreciated your thoughts and your um, direction here um, in thinking about how EPSL can really step up um, and make sure that we are serving our, our role here. We're focused on building broad understanding, which is that focus on data and KPIs to make sure that we have an under, a framework for understanding the work that's been going on. So I think that is a piece of it. Um, and then picking up topics that are important to the board. Um, so the data conversation will continue. The second topic we've been focused on is early college. Um, and I know many of the board was in attendance at that meeting last week. We will continue the discussion around early college programs. We heard at our last EPSL meeting about the good work that's going on throughout the system um, in terms of partnerships and early college. We also heard a bit about the challenges and the barriers to expand that. Um, so when we meet in late May, um, Yasmin is putting together a summary of those challenges and barriers. And we will also hear um, from another system. Um, we'll have a guest speaker at our May meeting where they are pushing early college programs and some technical programs really in partnership with the high school. So we will hear a bit more about that at our next meeting. And then lastly, um, we at our last meeting heard an initial presentation from the RPK group, which is a consulting group that the system has hired to take a look at the academic programs. And again, Jim, I think this will come back to your point, which is how do we as a board engage effectively in our role um, in, in overseeing academic programs in a way that's, that truly respects that understanding and partnership with faculty and the role of faculty governance. So the RPK group is very well respected in higher education. And I think they um, will serve us well in that they are taking an approach that really partners with faculty to understand what's being done and are going to bring back to us as a board a framework 
for thinking about academic programs going forward. Um, so Yasmin, if you can talk a bit to close out our, our EPSL report here on what you're expecting from RPK and what the board's role and what EPSL's role will be in that process going forward. Thank you. So at, at this stage in the analysis, RPK is sort of starting and it talked with EPSL a little bit about looking at that full range of what we do. We have over 200 programs, just, just looking at the three institutions of Castleton, Northern Vermont University and Vermont Tech. Um, and they're thinking about those programs to try to say, well, what what really is making sense in terms of from a student demand perspective, from labor market perspective, and then what is what is a sustainable array of programs. So the, the first kind of full pass of their analysis is something that they will be sharing with, um, of course, our chief academic officers, but then a, a system-wide uh, faculty academic affairs focus group. Um, which has already heard kind of the first stage of how they were structuring the analysis and, and working through their methodology. So that group will, will have a first chance to hear about the work and, and provide some feedback. Um, we expect them to do a further presentation that'll be available system-wide for faculty uh, as, they're, as they're working on refining recommendations. Um, so what the board, what, what they will ultimately be bringing is a, is a final recommendation on what an ideal portfolio would look like for programs to give the board a sense again of how those pro what those programs look like in terms of student demand, in terms of labor market alignment. And then by sort of cluster area of programs, some recommended next steps for action. Um, and again, you know, going back to the board kind of um, authority uh, and responsibilities conversation from earlier, you know, a lot of the next step work, you know, the, the questions of what and the questions of program is a, is a, is a area of board authority. Um, but the, the next step after that, we're asking them to think about recommendations in terms of what would be supportive of guiding faculty work to say, okay, how do we, how do we move forward with some of these? what the what looks like. So that'll be a, a next step to come out of, out of the work of, of our PK group. Any questions? There was a two page uh, description of what they presented at EPSL in the packet. And if anyone has any questions, uh, this is what they followed during that meeting. I thought it was well presented. Anyone have any other thoughts? Okay, we don't need a motion on that. Uh, we're gonna go back to um, number four for the report from the executive committee. Uh, this was a, a committee that we held on um, March 4th. And we uh, do have some motions that come from this. We had a discussion of the long range planning committee. Um, we're putting that on a temporary hold for now because so much of what we're doing as a board is actually long range planning, actually short, plan, short range planning and long range planning. Um, and because we've been meeting every month, plus committees, plus special meetings, whatever. The point is, is that we really have to give ourselves a, a little bit of a rest. And one thought was to, for the time being, we would put a hold on the long range planning committee uh, we're certainly that's what we're doing literally at every meeting anyway uh, so that is um and they basically all members of the long-range planning serve on both epsil or the faculty and fa facility and um, financial committees anyway and of course many times almost everybody in the board goes to those meetings so it's something that we think right now is a little redundant that doesn't mean it's dead forever because it will have an important role in the future so, um, Sophie, have I, as a chancellor, have I covered just about everything with that discussion, that explanation? I think so, yes. <laughs> okay, so I would like to entertain a motion uh, that we um, suspend the Long Range Planning Committee at the present time. So moved. Thank you, Bill. Okay, a second on that. Jim Maslin seconds it. Okay, any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, we're going to ask that the, those who approve of suspending for the time being the Long Range Planning Commission please, Committee, please uh, indicate by saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? 
Okay, we have suspended that for the time, the present time. The other thing is, and I think I need some help from the, um, from the chancellor on this, but we have a recommendation to retain live stream recordings until the minutes of the recorded board or committee meeting have been approved at the following meeting. Uh, we have been ma making recordings of mid minutes and recordings of meetings uh, that are plentiful, maybe more than ever, just like everybody else has. Um, but the chancellor may want to go into a little bit of a discussion of this to explain how we're going to deal with it. Yeah, so a question had come up because we have so many recordings on our live stream um, website. So, and there's been confusion where people have wanted to go and sort of watch a meeting and then they've halfway through realized they're in the wrong meeting. And so um, a question had come up as to how long we should be holding on to those recordings. When we moved to doing Zoom, you know, I guess a year ago, um, we didn't really talk about how long we would, you know, we would hold on to those recordings. I think they've been really valuable. I think people have really been engaged. Um, you know, doing our meetings this way has really enabled people to participate and to watch, mm -hmm. um, you know, rather than taking the trek to a, you know, campus across the state and then, you know, sitting in a room or, or whatever. And I, I certainly really appreciate all the attendance we've had from trustees and I've got to think that uh, in large part that's also due to this format being easier for for folks to participate in um, so we did have a discussion at the executive committee about how long we should hold on to recordings um, and the suggestion was made that um, the minutes are the formal record of a meeting so once we have the next meeting and the minutes are approved for a particular meeting that then that recording would be taken off um, the live stream. It doesn't mean they go away. They, they are still available. If somebody wanted to request, you know, I want to see what happened at the long range planning committee meeting that you had last July. Uh, we still have those recordings. They're still available and can be requested. It's really just a question of what's publicly available that people can just click on uh, right away. So that was the suggestion. We had talked about whether we should do uh, lengths of time um, but uh, the suggestion was doing it. So for example, this meeting would stay live until we have another meeting at which the minutes from this meeting are approved. And that way it kind of covers things like, you know, audit committee, which maybe doesn't meet as frequently. Those minutes would stay up, you know, maybe several months until the next audit committee meeting, uh, a, a committee that meets more frequently, they wouldn't stay up quite as long because once the minutes are approved that that posting could, could be taken down. So that was the thought. But again, you know, we want to be transparent about it. We want to make sure everyone um, understands what we're doing, why we're doing it. So um, it seemed appropriate to, to bring that forward for the board to consider. Okay, we need a motion to that effect that we will be um, holding, we're going to retain the live stream meetings, recordings until the minutes of the recorded board or committee meeting have been approved at the following meeting. I so need a moved. motion on that. So move from David, any second? Second from uh, Ryan Cooney. Any uh, other questions or discussions about this? Bill. Yeah, yeah I just want to just, uh, Sophie, so, so that's helpful, your explanation. Um, to be honest, uh, we're so involved in doing similar things only on YouTube as well in the, in the legislative format. Uh, so these are recordings that are maintained on Zoom. Is that right? Is that or I, uh, I'm not the right person to ask. That we have a website where they're all where they're all retained. So they're not retained in Zoom. I think it's through YouTube. But okay. if you go click, so on our website, if you click, you'll it's the way, same way you do for the legislative sessions. You'll see a whole host of meetings all pop up. So there's a um, YouTube channel. Is that? Yes, it's a YouTube channel and it's on vsc.edu slash live. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, all those who uh, approved to the retaining the live stream recordings basically until the minutes have been approved in the following meeting, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone aye. opposed? Okay, that, had, that motion has passed. There really was nothing else discussed at the executive meeting. Um, the next thing we have is the um, 
the granting of an emeritus status to John Knox from VTC. Um, would the president of VTC like to uh, take the floor and discuss what we're doing here with John Knox? Thank you, Chair Dickinson. Um, we do very much appreciate the board's consideration of John Knox for emeritus status, faculty emeritus status. Um, uh, John was 100% uh, committed to his craft as a dedicated faculty member here with his first priority being the students. Hence his teaching at Vermont Tech for almost a half a decade. Um, math also is a gateway course for Vermont Tech students. It's critical in literally every program and essential in so many. And math is something I'll speak for myself, not a lot of us get terribly excited about particularly young folks who would just as soon avoid it. But John seemed to make it a course that students enjoyed. He made it comprehensible and he gave it context to what they were learning in their regular course content. Those aha moments are so important to help students understand why math is so important. And you have the write-up that we submitted, which I think speaks for itself, but I just thought I'd share with you a few comments from some of John's colleagues. I won't name these faculty members, but this is from a fellow math teacher um, who, who speaks of students at Vermont Tech's ben benefiting from his skilled and caring teaching practices for over 40 years. A particular salience now is that he taught the very first course that Vermont Tech offered over Vermont Interactive Television in the late 1980s. It was a calculus course originating in the VIT studio in Randolph Center and delivered to students in Newport. He went on to teach summer calculus over VIT most summers for over 20 years to all studios around the state. John is also generous with his colleagues. When I started here in the fall of 2004, he shared with me the resources he had created for the courses that I was gonna teach that semester. Whenever I had a question or needed some guidance related to my work, he's always been available. Is dedicated to the success of students at Vermont Tech, to the success of his colleagues, and the success of the institution. We have an English professor who wrote of a reporter from Boston Globe coming to one of his first VIT classes and an article in the Globe about that work, which was pioneering at that time. He taught VTC or brought VTC classes to every high school student via Vermont Interactive Television, and even these recordings were copied on VHS tapes. For those of us who remember what those are that were mailed to students who needed to take math class in the summer. The last rendition of those classes before the learning management software took over was a transfer to flash drives that were mailed to students. Um, John was amongst the first faculty to teach classes on site at businesses such as the CREATE program at IBM, which he taught on site at IBM for many years. He was the first recipient of the Harry Wirtz Master Teacher Award and all of John's accomplishments pair in comparison to his influence on students through the years. We will remember his teaching, his desire to help them succeed and his passion for the Boston Red Sox. What more do you need to know? Um, the last faculty member who is an architectural engineering faculty speaks of, I, I teach an engineering field that is highly mathematical. I spent hours talking with John about mathematics instruction and the integration of mathematics into my course. He was always pleased when he would see that I was having students apply what they learned in the mathematics course. John would also occasionally uh, provide a mathematics puzzler. In one pro case, a program that he had not solved, nor have I yet, that appeared par paradoxical. Many years ago, John and I served on a task force for our local high school on the topic of improving math instruction to better prepare students for college. It is this type of academic inquiry and, and just interest that makes him a role model for faculty. And thus, I believe the status of Professor Emeritus is warranted. With that, I will let the um, letter we sent to the chancellor speak for itself. We think John would be a model Professor Emeritus. I, he is not aware that this uh, status may be bestowed upon him. And we're hoping to present that at a future board meeting should the board approve his status today. Thank you. Thank you, President Moulton. And yes, at some point in the future, we will hope to be meeting in person and we will actually be able to congratulate and applaud John Knox for this award. Are there any questions or anything about, is anyone here other than uh, the president who would like to speak on behalf of Professor Knox? Seeing none, thank you very much, Pat. That was a very, that was a really helpful exciting presentation about a math professor. 
So we congratulate him. We need a motion uh, to award the, um, the uh, emeritus status to this faculty member, John Knox. Do I have a motion? So moved. Linda Milne moves a second. Sure, why not? Oh, David was Jim, thank you. Okay, we've Go got- Go ahead, Jim. <laughs> Jim and Megan are competing. Okay, we'll, we'll give that to Jim. Um, <laughs> any more discussion, any questions? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of awarding the faculty emeritus status to faculty member John Knott, uh, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Megan, did you aye. want to say something? All those opposed? Seeing none, we have awarded this. Thank you very much to President Pat Moulton. Thank you very much for this honor for our Vermont Tech faculty member who has just recently retired. So thank you. Well, that's great. I mean, it's too bad he's retired because it sounds like we could use more like him. Okay. Um, now we're going down to the next item on the agenda, which is a legislative update. Um, we're going to have two parts of this. One is going to be from the Chancellor and Catherine Levasseur, and the other will be from Sharon Scott, who will go through the second pass of the budget. So shall we start with uh, the Chancellor? Yes, I think Catherine has a slides that she will be sharing, and I think she's kicking it off. So it's a team okay. effort here. Thank you. I guess I'm kicking it off. I think you're um, starting, Sophie. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we've had a remarkable first few months in the 2021 legislative session, and we have been working uh, closely with legislative leadership, the Joint Fiscal Office, the governor's staff, and members of the administration and our committee liaisons to advocate for our students, our institutions, and our future in the FY22 budget ask. And you may recall that back in January, the governor had recommended that the Vermont State College system receive a one-time $20 million appropriation to support system transformation on top of our $30 million uh, base appropriation. And that was a tremendous first step in the budget process and we were very uh, thrilled to receive his support. And today I'm pleased to share with you that thanks to the hard work of our team and the support of legislative leaders, committee chairs, our liaisons and more, the House is recommending a record and unprecedented $97 million in dollar investment in the Vermont State Colleges for this year. So we've, you know, we've we've hoped this was coming for, for some time, but it is officially here. We know we have a long way to go, but um, um, we are very, very excited about this. So as you can see, the investment consists of a combination of state and federal funds. It's made up of the 30.5 million, which is, has been our standard base appropriation, a $5 million permanent increase to the base, which is critically important to us because again, the select committee had recommended getting us up close to 48 million over time. So this is a, a step in the right direction that we're very encouraged by. Um, 21 million in bridge funding, 20 million in transformation money and 20.5 million in critical occupation scholarships and workforce development. So the House completed their work on the budget yesterday and voted unanimously to support it. So our key takeaways for you today are that the proposed permanent increase to our base appropriation of $5 million, again, bringing our base appropriation up to 35.5 million in future years the proposal to pre-fund four years of transformation costs, totaling 20 million, uh, the investment of the 20.5 million in student stipends and scholarships, which we're gonna talk about um, in more detail here in a moment, uh, which is an enormous benefit to our students and really I think will help us with the affordability and accessibility pieces that, that we're working on as part of our strategic priorities. In addition, the house proposed legislative requirements for the Vermont State College System Board and the Chancellor as an accountability mechanism for receiving the increased funding that we need moving forward. So we'll talk about that in a moment as well. So as you know from the February board meeting, the Vermont State Colleges sought $20 million in transformation costs from the legislature, of which $8 million were designated for FY 2022. 
Due to the incredible influx of federal funds this year and other factors, the legislature determined that pre-funding our transformation requests was a worthy investment for which we are tremendously grateful. The Critical Occupations Scholarships came about because we had many conversations throughout the session about the students that we serve, the communities we serve, and our role in workforce development for Vermont. We listened carefully to legislators' ideas and thought about how we can fit in proposals for free tuition, workforce development, and especially in how we can make a college education more affordable to our students. The critical occupations proposals outline investments for a success successful future for our students, the state of Vermont, and the institution of the Vermont State Colleges. In developing this proposal, we considered who our students are, what Vermont needs, and how we can fill these gaps successfully. There is tremendous need for upskilling, reskilling, credentials, and degrees in Vermont's workforce. We see ourselves as critical to closing that gap which is why we proposed these critical occupations programs to the legislature. In addition to serving the affordability needs of our students, these program ideas balance where programs are taught, how they are taught, and their workforce development value to the state. These are investments that will strengthen us as we work through, through this transition, through enrollment incentives, transfer student incentives, and, and adult learner incentives. Additionally, several of these programs will close equity gaps between students by providing internship stipends to those enrolled in high needs occupations. The first proposal was for welcome home scholarships. And these are proposed for Vermonters transferring to Vermont State College's institutions from out of state institutions or for those returning to school after exiting in 2020-2021. This program's mission is to incentivize students to come home to Vermont or to return to complete their degree if they left school without finishing last year. The scholarship would provide up to $5,000 per year or $2,500 per semester to full-time students, so those taking 12 credits or more, and $3,000 per year or $1,500 per semester for part-time students, so that's those enrolled in 6 to 11 credits. And this is a $4 million investment by the state legislature and we believe will serve appro approximately 575 Vermont State College's students. The second proposal is a degree completion program. And that is a $3 million investment that serves approximately 200 students. This investment recognizes that the state has a goal of 70% of adult Vermonters obtaining a credential of value by 2025. And the degree completion program is targeted at Vermonters who have a gap in attendance of at least two years and those with at least 40 existing credits. The reason for this is that there is a high cost benefit calculation for an adult to return to school to complete a degree. A person with at least 40 credits under their belt would either be able to achieve an associate's or get most of the way to a bachelor's degree with 30 credits paid for. There are approximately 54,000 Vermonters with some college and no credential or degree who could benefit from this scholarship. Next is the Critical Occupations Graduate Internship Scholarships, and that is a requested $2 million investment that we estimate will serve approximately 100 students. This scholarship proposal is designed to target graduate students in fields of study that are of high need to the state of Vermont, but tend to have lower pay for graduates so those in the education and mental health counseling programs. These programs have an internship and practicum requirement that students are not paid for, but the students must have the college credits to support the internship. Paying for the internship credits and providing hourly compensation to the students reduces barriers to access and incentivizes more students to pursue these critical occupations in the future. The proposed scholarships would support the graduate credits required for the internship practicum up to 12 credits, plus compensation of approximately $15 per hour for up to 240 hours per semester. The Critical Occupations Undergraduate Internship Scholarships are a requested $1 million that serve approximately 300 Vermont State College's students. And like the Sister Graduate Internship Scholarship, this program would provide a stipend for undergraduate students enrolled in critical occupations in the allied health and education programs. This reduces barriers to access and enables our students to pursue their studies in these critical occupations. 
It also enables students who need income to support themselves and their families during school to be able to draw on the stipend while they complete the required internship work on top of their coursework. The scholarship would provide approximately $15 per hour for up to 240 hours per semester. The free tuition for critical occupations careers, we were, for that we requested $5.5 million and believe that we can serve approximately 500 students. This proposal provides last dollar tuition for one year for students enrolled in specific critical occupation career programs. We compiled a proposed list of programs that include the McClure Foundation's Best Bet programs and others that are essential to the state's future workforce needs. These include the bookkeeping certificate at CCV, the IT service desk specialist certificate, the certified production technician certificate, the graphic design certificate, software and web development program, the practical nursing program, electrical and plumbing apprenticeships, childcare, the childcare programs, both at CBU, NBU, and Castleton University, the allied health certificate, the nursing programs at Castleton University, Vermont Technical College, or the Allied Health Certificate at CCV, mental health counseling, paramedicine, dental hygiene, the certificate in accounting, small business management, radiologic science, and respiratory therapy. Mm -hmm. This program would be available to those, in currently those currently enrolled in these programs, as well as to new students. And the Workforce Development Initiative 2.0 is modeled on the successful CRF workforce initiative that the legislature asked the VFC to complete last fall. You may recall that that program enabled us to provide nearly 1400 courses and trainings to over 971 Vermonters whose employment was affected by the pandemic. In addition to covering the tuition for the courses, we provided wraparound services. So this is services for textbooks, transportation, technology, childcare assistance, and more. The 2.0 proposal doubles the, numbers, the number of estimated students served to 2,000, and additionally, it caps the individual participation at six credits or two courses, and we estimate the cost of this program will be approximately $3 million. And lastly, the Long-Term Care Facility practice, Practical Nursing Program requests an estimated $2 million and will serve approximately 40 students. This program is designed to address the skilled nursing shortage in the state and is for $2 million to be appropriated to the Department of Health to establish a partnership program between skilled nursing facilities and Vermont Technical College that would bring the LPN program to five skilled nursing facilities across the state to train current employees, such as nursing assistants, to become higher level providers. The funds would cover trainees tuition and fees and provide a stipend to meet their living costs, such as housing and childcare while they attend the program. The funds would also support VTC's instructional program and administrative costs. While additional nurses are needed in all practice settings, the need is especially great in the long-term care facilities and LPNs serve a critical role in delivering care directly to the residents in these facilities. Helping existing employees such as nursing assistants to become LPNs will enhance Vermont's healthcare workforce and advance these individuals' career and economic well-being. We are incredibly pleased that the House recommended funding for all of these proposed programs for a total investment in student scholarships and stipends of $20.5 million. This is a remarkable investment in our students, and we look forward to continuing to advocate for them throughout this process. As I mentioned before, uh, the House is also proposing, um, of, I guess I should say that given the investment in our students, they are also requesting that their investment be met with certain accountability metrics and reports back on the progress as the system undergoes transformation. So just to run through the requirements, uh, first the House bill requests that the Vermont State College system become a fully integrated system that achieves financial sustainability in a responsible and sustainable way. They've identified affordability, accessibility, and relevance as the key strategic priorities for our success. And of course, we're obviously pleased that those align with the board adopted priorities of affordability, accessibility, quality, and relevance last fall. Second, the House has proposed increased oversight by the General Assembly 
in the form of certain requirements that the Vermont State College system will need to meet as it undergoes system transformation, as well as metrics that we're to report back on in our annual presentations to the Education, Appropriations and Economic Development Committees in the House and the Senate. These requirements include that we reduce our structural deficit by $5 million per year for five years through a combination of annual operating expense reductions and increased enrollment revenues for a total of 25 million by the end of fiscal year FY26. We will be required to report the results of these structural reductions to the House and Senate Education and Appropriations Committees annually during our annual um, budget presentation. In addition, we must develop and implement a 10 year strategic plan for managing our physical assets that is a fiscally sustainable and maintains reasonable net asset value and meets the needs of Vermont learners. The board will need to approve the plan and we will need to present it to the House and Senate institutions committees by March 1st of 2022. We'll also be required to maintain our current uh, present campus locations as educational and student support centers while recognizing that changes in governance and operational structures, as well as program and service offerings may change as circumstances require. Additionally, beginning next year, we will need to brief the House and Senate Appropriations and Education Committees on enrollment levels in courses offered by the Vermont State Colleges. And they're looking for us to report on the basis of courses with fewer than five students, courses with five to nine students, courses with 10 to 14 students, et cetera along with the relevant information about the enrollment data. And that was something that really came out of the select committee report. Um, in order to demonstrate accessibility, they're also asking that the percentage of courses and programs offered by the Vermont State College system on a statewide basis and the formats in which they're being offered. We also need to report on an assessment of affordability and accessibility with the Vermont State Colleges and recommendations on how to improve both affordability and access for our students. We need to report on retention statistics with corresponding trend lines and benchmarks and enrollment statistics with relevant industry benchmarks that pertain to the student enrollment efforts authorized by the FY22 Vermont budget bill with the student net student revenues generated and discount rate applied in order to enroll the students aggregated by cohort and demographics of student enrollments aggregated by full-time and part-time students. Additionally, to help optimize student opportunities, we will complete implementation of seamless general education credit transfer between all institutions by the end of fiscal year 2023. And to ensure that we're meeting our responsibilities to Vermont businesses and communities, beginning in fiscal year 22, we're asked to report to the House and the Senate Economic Development Committees on advances in workforce readiness and meeting employer needs and this includes reporting on employer and institutional partnerships with the Vermont State Colleges, the progress in meeting critical employer needs, and the number of degrees and credentials of value awarded. We will also need to provide the House and Senate Committee on Education and Appropriations our profit and loss statements based upon the annual October financial statement and a report by institution on the overall net student revenue and inst institutional discounting of tuition metrics with relevant trends. Regarding the deficit reduction plan, we're being asked to report the activities that have generated expense cuts and activities that will result in enhanced revenues, as well as future plans to continue both efforts, along with information that demonstrates the status with trends and relevant industry benchmark information. We're also required to ensure that all Vermont State College Board of Trustees policies are adhered to and that we establish policies and procedures to implement the transformation plan and that we report back on the status of these also as part of the Chancellor's annual budget um, presentation to the House and Senate Committees on Education. We know the requirements are significant, but we do recognize that the proposed investment that's being made in the Vermont State College system is massive and it's unprecedented. And we know we not only can transform to become the higher education system, the state and the students are looking for uh, but we must do it. So the legislature reasonably enough seeks to hold us accountable to that goal and to the public dollars that we are being made stewards of. And I look forward to sharing our progress with you and with the legislature in the coming months. At this point, I do think it's important to acknowledge where we are in the state budget process. We received the governor's recommended budget in January. 
The budget has now passed the House of Representatives and in the coming weeks will be considered by the State Senate. After the House and Senate reconcile the differences in their budget proposals, the bill will then proceed to the governor for final approval before enactment on July 1st, the start of the next fiscal year. While the signals we've received up to this point are tremendously positive, and we are so excited about some of the programs and opportunities proposed by the legislature, we do have a long way to go before we reach the finish line. I am looking forward to our continued work with the legislature and with the governor as the budget moves forward. And next, I will turn things over to CFO Scott to share an update on the FY22 budget projections. So the second pass budget of the Vermont State Colleges persists at between $32 million and $45 million in deficit. There has been some modest movement um, in areas where we have firm definitions of changes. So for example, um, we have a firm understanding of our medical insurance rates, and we have been able to apply that. Though, as we've all seen, with all of the movement that's going on in the environment, it's very difficult for us to make a significant shift away from our worst likely scenario or from our best likely scenario, though much of the news that we've discussed in the last several slides um, gives us some very positive indications. Um, the actual deficit, as shown here, is between $32 and $45 million. Before the application of FY21 Carry Forward, the Higher Education Relief Fund that we just spoke about earlier today, and the FY21 Budget, Budget Adjustment Act, or any of the activities that we've just discussed here. This deficit is composed primarily of two factors. The first is COVID-related revenue losses, estimated at approximately $20 million, and the structural deficit of approximately $25 million. Historically, the Vermont State Colleges have received a general fund base appropriation, excluding allied health and global commitment funds, of $30.5 million. For the current fiscal year, in addition to the base appropriation, the Vermont State Colleges received very generous funding from the legislature and governor, including $28.8 million in one-time bridge funding, $22.8 million in coronavirus relief funds to address business disruptions due to the public health emergency, $2.3 million in CRF funding for the Workforce Development Program, Chancellor Zadotny just discussed, and $5 million in additional CRF from the FY21 Budget Adjustment Act. While we are, were required to return some of the CRF monies due to the very tight spending restrictions on coronavirus relief funds, we are very grateful for the support of our legislature and the governor as their support has really made this year possible. The Select Committee on the Future of Public Higher Education in Vermont recommended a $17.5 million increase in the base appropriation to address capacity and affordability of the Vermont State Colleges. The Select Committee expects that this amount of additional base funding, which could be built up over several years, would offer adequate capacity within the VSC to allow us to evolve over time and improve affordability in the Vermont State Colleges, thus addressing barriers for access for Vermonters. As discussed in earlier meetings, the structural deficit is estimated at about $25 million. The Select Committee recommends reducing this structural deficit over five years at approximately $5 million annually via a combination of decreased costs and modest increases in revenue. Transforming the Vermont State Colleges system will take both time and money. And as discussed earlier in this presentation, transformation is estimated at $20 million and is divided up over four years. As shown here, the FY22 portion of transformation expenses is approximately $8 million. In total, the Vermont State Colleges estimates needing $81 million in funding over and above its operating revenue to operate in FY22 before the use of other funding sources and deficit reduction activities. To offset this $81 million in required funding for FY22, the Vermont State Colleges estimates being able to apply approximately $15 million in one-time funding to this issue. First, the VSC anticipates using $5 million in CRF funds 
authorized by the legislature as part of the FY21 Budget Adjustment Act to offset additional expenditures related to business disruption. The VSC will use these funds to cover such items as public health and public safety employees, COVID surveillance testing, and increased cleaning and sanitation. Next, as discussed as part of the second quarter process, the institutions within the Vermont State Colleges have taken strong measures to reduce current year expenditures. As of the end of the second quarter, we expect to have $5 million in carry forward funding from FY21 available to assist with FY22. The Higher Education Emergency Re uh, Recovery Act, HERF II, was approved on December 27, 2020. As discussed in the Finance and Facilities meeting from earlier this morning, these funds may be used to defray expenses associated with coronavirus, as well as make additional financial aid great grants to students. The Vermont State Colleges currently anticipates that approximately $5 million of these funds will offset the anticipated deficit for FY22. The Vermont State Colleges need, after application of anticipated carry forward, higher education emergency relief funding, and the Budget Adjustment Act is therefore $66 million as shown here. As noted earlier, the historical base appropriation for the Vermont State Colleges is $30.5 million. The House has approved an increase in general fund base of $5 million and bridge funding of $21 million to address our remaining structural deficit. Additionally, the House has budgeted $20 million to cover the full cost of transformation. For FY22, the Vermont State Colleges anticipates spending $8 million of these funds, as shown on the right side of the slide. And finally, the House has budgeted $20.5 million for critical occupations programming. The Vermont State Colleges anticipates that it will receive approximately $1.5 million in net additional revenue from these efforts during FY22. The total budgeted appropriation, as was mentioned earlier in this presentation, as noted by the House, is $97 million for FY22. This corresponds to the Vermont State College's need of $66 million, as shown on the right side of the slide. We are extremely grateful and humbled by the outpouring of support we have seen by the legislature and the governor throughout this process. We recognize that the House's budget is just one step in the long road to the end of the legislative session, but it gives us significant hope. As approved by the House, the appropriations budget for the Vermont State Colleges fully addresses the worst likely deficit. It is important for us to acknowledge that if approved, this funding comes with significant requirements and expectations for action. The Vermont State Colleges cannot and will not remain as we are today. Rather, we must transform to meet the needs of Vermont, Vermonters, and our region. We must become more efficient and fiscally sustainable, and we must take these actions now to set ourselves up for a better future. We are grateful for the very strong expression of support by the House, and we look forward to the future. Thank you, Sharon. Any questions, any extra comments? David, you did not review this second uh, view of the budget, the past uh, in your committee, we did this as the full board. Is that correct? That That is correct. Anybody have any questions? Go ahead, Linda. I, I clearly, as you, um, as management uh, <clears throat> stated, there are requirements which come with this funding. Mm -hmm. It leaves those um, that sounded on reporting um, key performance indicators, other monitoring statistics. Those sounded to me as though they would be very much in keeping with what we as a board want to be monitoring anyway. Didn't sound in that way, a sort of financial performance as though there was anything 
out of the ordinary or extreme that we wouldn't already be looking at. Is that a fair, does that, is that how you as management also perceive it or did I misunderstand what I was hearing? Yes. Yeah, generally speaking, that's, that's correct. We did work closely uh, with our liaison with the House Appropriations uh, Committee. Um, his concern was very much not to, not to make more work for us than we needed to do. Um, he did look both at the select committee report and at the work that the board has done, uh, the strategic priorities work that you've done and tried to marry the two up. So this was not duplicative work. Um, certainly from his committee, there were other, um, other members of the appropriations committee that had other um, items that they wanted included in there. So it, it was a little bit more expansive than perhaps we had hoped, but these uh, generally, I believe you're right, these are well aligned with what we've already been talking about in terms of strategic priorities and key performance indicators. So it will be, um, yeah, it shouldn't be generating a, a huge amount of additional work for us. It will just make sure that we're held accountable for what we already were planning on doing. Anyone else, Adam? I'm just curious why the uh, so little of the critical career component would be in FY22 uh, and how that gets spread out over the years. Yeah, I think the funding is not limited to FY22 um, is one piece of it. Um, the other piece is it will take us some time to get things set, set up. Uh, you know, in the fall, we rushed to get the workforce development piece um, set up. So we will have a little bit more time, but I, I think the anticipation is that these programs will get, uh, the bulk of them will get set up um, soon. Um, the, I know, for example, the um, LPN long-term care one, I think is a, is a couple of years in the making. So I don't think that goes into effect for another year, but because there's a significant amount of work that needs to happen, but I'll let Sharon chime in too, because there's a net revenue issue here as well. So um, many of the programs that are proposed have significant value to the state of Vermont in terms of advancing workforce needs, but they may not have um, a contributing net revenue component. So what we've shown on the slide here, um, the slides that we just showed you, is the, the, the net revenue spinoff that we would anticipate coming from the programs. So for example, if we look at the two um, sister programs regarding uh, internships. There's actually no additional net revenue spinoff from those programs, but they're highly valuable to the state because it helps us advance the workforce needs of the state there. Um, so what we anticipate from the overall value is about 25% um, of the net revenue from that and in terms of total program value. So just to follow up on that. So the of the 20 million, not necessarily all 20 million would be spent within the system. Some will be spent outside of the system. Uh, some some will be spent on things like wraparound services. So those don't have a net revenue component. It, it's a pass through. So money comes in and it goes directly out. But we would still be budgeting for that. Um, that would be budgeted once we um, we actually. In, a, in one of the reasons why we did not come forward with the full F and F with the past due budget is because so much of our budget is wrapped up in how the um, the final appropriations bill will look. Um, that it will yes, it will ultimately be budgeted. So we will need to be able to budget that. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I, I just want to thank the key people here and in the legislature who work so hard to bring this to us. And I would just tell you uh, just a couple of thoughts. First, in the, in the history of man, many times, many times, <clears throat> positive transformational things have come out of very unfortunate circumstance and suffering. And this would be a prime example of that. Uh, lots of things that, that um, many of us had dreamed about happening at the VSC are now possible to be done that didn't seem possible before and that we didn't have the attention to do before. Um, so I would make that comment. And I understand, I don't think the requirements are onerous. I think they're reasonable and necessary and good. 
So as a citizen of the state, I'm pleased that we have those um, requirements. Um, and I know there are lots of details here that we're not gonna cover now. I do have a question about education. There was a comment, if I, if I understood correctly, is, is there a component here about teacher education? Can someone answer that? Is that part of this program as well? Yes, it was included as part of the critical occupations um, project list on the graduate um, internship. So it, again, there are some of the, the programs we have educational programs are expensive for students to complete. And when they leave, they're not going into very high paying jobs. So the thought was to make it um, you know, cheaper for students to obtain the education to come out of it with less student debt um, and then encourage people to go into those fields moving forward. So education was one of them in terms of the practicum that's required for, for students in education. Was, were there um, content areas highlight, highlighted or is that open to decision and discussion? There weren't specific um, areas within education. It was for both graduate and undergraduate, but it wasn't by particular um, topic area within, within education as a whole. Just again, just thank you everyone. And I know this was a heavy lift and uh, Catherine, you're brand new to our system and to get thrown into this the way you have. We're so lucky that you had all the experience you had and came to us with the legislative experience. You were a godsend. Thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to help the system. Okay, Adam, you're next. Thank you. Um, so just following up on the critical careers, just understanding how that's going to be marketed when those scholarships would be available. You know, we heard in the presentation the number of students who could be assisted. Um, and when those students will, those, those scholarships will be available. So I don't know if today is necessarily when, when that has to happen, but it'll be helpful uh, as a trustee to understand when that'll get rolled out and, and how that'll be marketed. I mean, we still have to complete the legislative process, but um, I know I've met with the workforce development team that from across the system that um, has, have, have continued to meet following uh, last fall's uh, workforce initiative. And um, I've made clear to them that they should start planning um, for some of these now because um, we, you know, it takes time to set up and we need to start thinking about it. So they're already thinking about that. We're already thinking about what are the business processes to support, um, to support that workforce initiative 2.0. Um, but I'm, I'm sure we will be following up uh, with that. We don't want to wait until, you know, the very end. And some of these are going to have shorter lead times. Some of them will have longer lead times. So we, we definitely need to be planning ahead. Um, it's another reason we'll, we'll talk a little bit in a, about the transformation update, but it was one of the reasons that I'm glad uh, we had been exploring whether to move up um, accreditation um, for, for the new combined entity by a year. And when we were exploring that, um, you know, it became apparent that it wouldn't, wouldn't be possible to do it. But I was also thankful that we made the decision to stick with the, the current timeline of uh, July of 2023, in part because of these additional uh, projects, we want to make sure we do them successfully and that people have a good experience with the BSC when they go through them. So we want to make sure we do it right. Anyone else? David. I think the requirements of the legislature are appropriate in things that we would do ourselves to hold ourselves accountable. Um, the one item that um, I think is a very heavy lift um, and painting specific numbers on it um, is fraught a little bit. And, and that is reducing our structural deficit by $5 million per year. Um, to put a specific number on that, given the fact that some of that comes out of expense, but some of that is also driven by revenue, which is very, very difficult to predict. Um, I, I think it's a, an admirable goal, but not, but, but that will not be achieved without effort and pain. 
And I think that we, we need to be cognizant of that going into this, that this is not going to be an easy thing. Yeah, and that was certainly that $5 million per year is something that came out of the select committee recommendations. So it's, um, you know, along with, you know, the select committee did recommend significant increased investment in the Vermont State College system, but also did recommend that we, we look to cut that structural deficit by 5 million a year. But I, I hear what you're saying, um, Trustee Silverman, in terms of how do we quantify that and how do we, do we, how do we show it? Um, the other thought that was behind some of these, um, you know, the reporting requirements was really in our favor. It was the goal was to make sure that we, we you know, we're invited back again to the different committees next legislative session and that they, you know, they see us and we've got lots to report on. So I view some of this as well as being of benefit to us because it hopefully will make sure the legislature doesn't forget about us. And well, we gave them a lot of money last year, so we should be all good and we don't need to continue a conversation with the Vermont State College system. We've been trying to be clear with the legislature that it's taken us decades to get into the situation we've been in. It will certainly take us some time um, and, and money to get us out of this situation as we move forward. And we don't want to get forgotten um, as we move forward. So I, again, I see these reporting requirements as also serving the benefit of, of putting us in front of the legislature um, and having conversations with them about how we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Bill and then Karen. Yes, I, I, I wanna say a couple things. One is that um, in terms of the net revenue value of some of the workforce investments that are being made, uh, while there are not in each instance a quote net dollar value to the institution, there is incomparable value in terms of the partnership between the legislature's goal of addressing workforce issues and having having the Vermont State Colleges firmly in mind as the uh, agent who is able to partner with the legislature and the executive branch in achieving workforce goals for Vermonters. Uh, so that the value that comes is far exceeds uh, just the net revenue, which, which is also important, there's no doubt, there's, that's also important. It also goes to those Vermonters who are going to have the experience of up training and uh, changing uh, their employment opportunities for them, their families, uh, through the Vermont State College system. Again, uh, a, a tangible and intangible value to us going forward. And, and lastly, uh, I would just mention that I happen to be highly invested in the legislature in healthcare workforce issues, and we have advocated for a number of years now. There's a desperately we desperately need uh, additional healthcare workforce. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly familiar because that's where I'm focused right now. And so we were very excited uh, to support even before this all cascaded into where it is now. Uh, the state colleges having a role in healthcare workforce is an important ongoing investment. Uh, we, we could train every one of the folks listed here and the same number of folks and many more are needed in our healthcare workforce in Vermont. We should position ourselves to be an essential and key trainer of the entire work, healthcare workforce industry in Vermont. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm um, and I maybe lastly, let's not forget our federal delegation who frankly brought home money to Vermont disproportionately to the size and population of our state and we, as we as we move forward, uh, as as Karen so properly said, uh, out of the tragedy that we're in the midst of of COVID, there has become opportunities that we would never possibly have dreamed of, and uh, and our federal delegation it has played a very very important role as well. Thank you, Karen. Uh, just, just to um, continue David's concern, uh, when I read that, I read that as a, a very heavy lift and one that won't be met without tremendous suffering. 
but I'm pleased that it's there. And I'm pleased that it's there because it will keep the board and the system focused on a reality that must be met in order for us to be sustainable. The gift, so to speak, that we've been given with this great opportunity will be lost if we don't focus on sustainability. And that won't be reached without significant change, which is gonna cause some discomfort, perhaps suffering for people and the system. So I'm pleased that it's there and I'm pleased that we're, our feet are gonna be held to the fire. And I would like to add something here you know, as we talk about workforce, and I'm going to make a pitch that isn't directly related to the VSC, any of us who have had to access program that is managed by state personnel, um, there's a shortage of those people. So I, I don't know if there are more legislators than even those here. If you're trying to access, and I've heard that complaint, you can be on the phone leave messages that are never returned and, and uh, very difficult to access general programs right now. And I know Bill's smiling. He knows that there's a, our state workers are overwhelmed mm -hmm. by what's going on right now. And, and we need some assistance to make all of this work. So again, thank you. Anyone else have any comments? Uh, I do have a couple of observations and I just want to give a thank you. The uh, observation is that many of these critical occupation and scholarship programs are geared in fact toward precisely the population that we are trying to reach. These are non-traditional adult students, people who have some college, who don't go on to college. There's a large number of people who have no credentials or no way that they can find of going on to get further education after high school. And that's what these um, scholarships and these programs that were outlined by uh, Catherine are designed to, uh, uh, to attract and to work with. Uh, the internship uh, scholarships are primarily aimed at adult students who have to work and go to school. And when they have to do student teaching or do a practicum or go some kind of a clinical rotation or something, they can't do that if they're working. So they have barriers that need to be addressed so they can actually afford to continue their education. So I think that I'm very thankful. And I think that we did, we got a great service out of our administrative team and our and the various people in our on our campuses who put this together because it addresses exactly the items that we've talked about in Advanced Vermont and in our in our programs to get to uh, increased accreditation, increased credentials, increased degrees for our for our industries and for our students and our for our Vermonters, and I personally would like to thank uh, Catherine for putting together a really well done introduction and. Um, that she gave to me that she just repeated now that was very, very good to present on the floor. And I am uh, eternally grateful. Nobody else could have done it better. So thank you, Catherine. That I think takes care of that piece. Do we have anything else to say about our uh, legislative uh, update before we move on? If not, we can move on to the Update from the Chancellor on transformation planning. Uh, oh, just, sorry, we have one more thing. Report from the Finance and Fills Facilities Committee. It's already been touched on a little bit. David, would you like to talk about the HERF grant requests? Indeed, I would love to. Um, I think many of the trustees uh, were at the brief Finance and Facilities Committee meeting uh, earlier. Um, and. Uh, of the two action items we had, one of them was to review and uh, approve recommending to the full board the acceptance of the HERF grants uh, that have been promised uh, to our um, individual institutions. Uh, Sharon, would you mind giving a little color? 
Uh, not at all. I'd be happy to. So the HERF grants, as we discussed at the Finance and Facilities Committee meeting, are intended to assist the colleges with defraying the expenses or offsetting lost revenues of, associated with the public health crisis. In addition, the grants also offer the opportunity for the institutions to be able to supply funds to student in the form of financial aid grants that can be used for a variety of activities, including any component of their cost of attendance, as well as other things like emergency housing, food, um, a transportation and other activities. Um, there are no downsides to accepting these grants. There is no match from the federal government there are significant compliance expectations as there are with any federal grant, um, but we're very excited about the possibilities of being able to accept these. Excellent, thank you. Um, so um, the committee is uh, recommending uh, that the full board uh, approve these grants and I would make that in the form of a motion. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to accept these grants. Do we need a second? Adam Grinald is a second. Uh, Bill, would you like to discuss something? You're you're muted. I think it might be helpful to have a sense of the uh, scope of the grants in terms of dollars. Uh, Twelve million dollars. Yeah, I'm not sure everyone who's attending now might have understood that. So. That's divided between the institutions and student aid. Okay, any other questions or discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the HERF two grants for the um, colleges, please indicate by saying aye. 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 No, no one's opposed, the motion has passed. Now we can go, thank you, David and Sharon. Now we can go on to the transformation update from the chancellor, please. Yeah, so I, this should be relatively brief. I just wanted to um, sort of fill you in on what's been happening. It's been almost uh, four, almost five weeks since our February 22nd board meeting at which the board voted to accept the recommendations of the legislative created select committee to seek a common accreditation for Castleton University, Northern Vermont University and Vermont Technical College, maintaining a physical presence at their primary locations, along with aggressive coordination of administrative services system wide. So in thinking about a transformed Vermont State Colleges system, we seek to transform the organizational and operational model of the Vermont State College system into one that's fiscally sustainable and fulfills the Vermont State College System's mission of meeting the needs of students and the state of Vermont. The vision is to have two strong institutions, the Community College of Vermont and a single unified university with a balanced portfolio of academic programs and re-envisioned uh, residential programming. We are seeking to expand access across the state to our degree programs, as well as to credit and non-credit bearing certificates and credentials of value. And in doing that, we're also looking to transform our administrative operations with a single set of business processes, policies, and practices system-wide where possible. The goal is not to replicate our existing processes within a single accredited institution, but to take the time to plan and think through how we can do things better and operate more efficiently and effectively in the future. So to date, we have held a project management orientation with the senior leadership teams from all of the institutions and the chancellor's office. We have posted the position of the Vermont State College System Director of Transformation, as well as posting an RFP for a firm or consultant um, to bring professionalized project management uh, to the transformation. Um, and just to be clear with that, the goal is not to hire both. The goal was to cast a wide net and see what kind of responses we got and then make a decision as to whether we would do this as an internal hire or, or hire an external um, consultant to assist us. Uh, we have established a hiring committee and we've already received over 500 applications in response to the posting. So that was as of yesterday, it may be more now. Um, the hiring committee is being chaired by our chief financial officer and chief operations officer, Sharon Scott. We also have um, Mike Stevens, the Director of Facilities from Northern Vermont University, who has extensive experience in project management when he was working for the state. 
We have Katie Mobley, the Dean of Enrollment and Community Relations from the Community College of Vermont. Uh, we have Kathy Koslick, the Dean of the College of Business at Castleton, and then Bob Zyder, the Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Vermont uh, Manufacturing Extension Center at VTC, VMEC. Uh, so the hiring committee will be responsible for initially vetting and screening applications. And their first kickoff meeting is, I believe is gonna be on Monday. Uh, the goal is to have interviews and presentations from the finalists towards the end of April with a final decision being made by April 30th. If any of the trustees are interested in being included in the final round of vetting, please uh, go ahead and let me know that. Um, the program array analysis work is progressing um, as we touched on before with RPK group. So in addition to presenting at uh, the last EPSL committee meeting, the RPK group also met with senior leadership from the colleges and the chancellor's office um, last week. Um, RPK is planning to meet with the academic advisory group, which is composed of chief academic officers and faculty during the week of April 5th. Uh, they're looking to hold a system-wide informational webinar and solicit input during the week of April 19th. And they're looking to present a recommended array of programs and identify the next steps for working with faculty on the program curriculum to the board at your next meeting on May 10th. Um, we've already touched on the single core of VSC general education requirements earlier, but um, just to reiterate, uh, that's still under consideration by some of our faculty assemblies for final approval, but it has received preliminary support for planning and initial implementation next year. And that propo proposal includes um, adding DEI learning outcomes across the curriculum and um, you know, that's going to require additional support for faculty development um, in connection with that work for the general education requirements. Also, following the last board meeting, uh, we undertook to explore the feasibility of moving up the timeline for seeking a common accreditation for the three institutions from July 2023 to July 2022. In order to do that, we held exploratory meetings with four key groups. Um, the admissions, marketing, financial aid, and registrars um, in order to vet the feasibility of a shorter timeline. Based on the information we received, it was clear that the risks of moving up the timeline were significantly outweighed, uh, significantly outweighed the benefits. Um, so we decided to stick with the timeline that we had presented to you at the February 22nd meeting. However, as a result of those meetings, um, a lot of positive things came out of that. And so those groups have identified a number of immediate projects that need to be undertaken. Uh, they've also identified a number of sequencing pieces of what needs to happen before something else can happen. And we're going to continue to, to work with those groups and develop project charters for them um, in the near future. In addition, we've had a number of other groups across the system um, who either have already been collaborating. Again, I had mentioned the workforce development, uh, continuing education folk earlier. Uh, there are other groups that have expressed an interest in starting to work with their colleagues across the system. And so some of those groups include uh, disability services, the development and alumni relations and our student life folk as well. Um, at this stage, what we are looking for is to encourage people to consider what is the best of what we currently do and what would we want to include moving forward that we currently do, but also to imagine and dream what the future could look like, you know, what are the possibilities and to think creatively rather than just seeking to replicate existing processes and existing structures in the new transformed uh, Vermont State College system. So we really also want to give people the time and space to have those conversations and to think ahead and to have a stake in, in what we look like moving forward. Um, we also have a number of projects that are still ongoing. So work is continuing on creating a system-wide virtual library. And there are a number of information technology projects. Um, as I um, have mentioned to you and have sent a communication out across the system, uh, Kelly Campbell, who has been the um, Chief Technology Officer at Vermont Technical College has, has stepped into the Chief Information Officer role She's been working closely with IT staff, both at the chancellor's office and across the system on rethinking our current IT organizational chart and how we're delivering all the different services that IT provides. 
Um, there's also there's a lot of IT work that is going on, including work on a system wide help desk and upgrading um, the VSC portal. Uh, since our last board meeting, we've had additional conversations uh, with Nechi, our accreditor, as well as um, Sharon and the financial aid officer and financial aid directors met with the US Department of Education uh, regarding the proposed unification of the three institutions. And both of those calls were helpful in our thinking about uh, what we need to do moving ahead and to make sure that our submissions, uh, when, when the time is right, are both timely and well received. Uh, we have come a very long way in the past year. I think we've referenced that already in this call. We do recognize there's a significant amount of work ahead of us, um, but with the support of both the legislative branch and, and the governor, the executive branch, I am confident that we can plan and implement a successful transformation and do it in a way that is thoughtful, inclusive, student focused, and demonstrates to the legislature that the Vermont State College system is worth a continued investment in. Um, looking ahead, uh, we're going to be seeking input and in the, I mean, again, I had reference with faculty working on the program array, but we're also going to be launching a form on the transformation website for people to provide feedback. And we do have another student forum coming up on April 6th. Uh, we also will be continuing to work with the, the legislature and the governor to secure the funding necessary for successful transformation. As, as Catherine explained, we're not there yet. We still have the rest of the process to get through. Um, also looking ahead, uh, we're planning to adjust the transformation timelines and the board's decision-making chart that we had provided at the February 22nd meeting. Those need to be updated based on the additional information that we've received. We're gonna be looking at putting into place a, a decision structure for each project, um, drafting project charters and creating project teams for the, the various key areas we also need to start work on planning uh, for hiring a new president uh, for the combined entity and um, also the process for selecting a name for the new entity, as well as developing communications plan and a strategic financial plan. So that is, is where we are. We certainly will be providing additional updates um, you know, as we go along at, at the board meetings. But if anyone had any other questions about the work to date, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the chancellor? That sounds exhaustive. It's, it's been exhaustive and exhausting, I will say, between the legislature and yeah, transformation. Both. It's been a very, very busy few weeks. So. We appreciate all the work that everyone in the system is doing. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, any other questions? If there aren't any, we will go on to the presidential updates. Uh, we will start with CCV. Is Joyce Judy here? She was going to get up to have to step away for a little bit. Uh, no, I'm here. I'm back. And you're back <laughs> I, uh, I was gone just a short time. So thank you for um, uh, letting me give you a few a few updates from CCV. Um, there's just two or three things I'd like to mention. One, I would just, and I know Karen Luno was on this, and I don't know if others have, but we've been doing this Abnaki speaker series. Um, and this is one of the silver linings from COVID. Uh, so we have been, uh, we've had three, we had three speakers in this series, and we've had two so far, we have one more. And they're an hour long presentation um, by um, three different people um, representing the Abnakis. And we have had between two and 300 people um, participate in each of those sessions. And, you know, if we had done this in a face-to-face, -face, and even in Winooski, we might have had 50, maybe 100 on a good night. But the fact that we could remove geography and have so much participation. So I think, you know, there's some things that we are going to, we need to take forward from COVID and that love being able to engage people throughout the state. Um, in this, and, and it's been so um, just enriching. So I would, we have our, our third series on April 15th, and I would encourage if anybody is interested, it's from uh, five, uh, five to six. And it's, you just, it's a very simple, you just register. There's no, no, it's all free. And, um, but it's just been really, really um, phenomenal. But the response has been um, equally impressive. So that's been, that's been sort of just a, an aside thing that we've been doing. 
Uh, secondly, um, we are about to start our summer registration. And just um, for the board's information, our summer schedule is going to look very similar to what we've done fall and spring. Um, we're offering five different formats with all of them having a very strong remote component. Um, we will offer the majority of our courses will be online. Um, a significant and growing, this is another one of those things that we need to take from COVID, are the combination of synchronous and online um, is growing in popularity far beyond what we thought it would be. So it's a combination of having some time um, virtually but scheduled with your class and your faculty. So it might be every third week on a Tuesday night from six to eight, but then the rest of the time it's online. But it's a way to have some structure and some a chance to meet your colleagues, um, not face-to-face, -face, but Zoom to Zoom. Um, and so that's been um, very interesting. So we're doing online, synchronous online, then our accelerated courses, um, our flex courses where they have five different start dates. And then we are doing some hybrids um, as we have, we were doing this spring, particularly with um, lab courses. And then as we um, get ready to move into fall, we are planning for um, a ramp up into on um, face-to-face. -face. Um, we will not be doing as many face-to-face -face as we did pre-COVID, um, but we will be doing um, um, a fair amount of face-to-face. -face. We're trying to figure out the right balance, but we also know that our students are really enjoying um, being able to, to remove geography and time from some of this. So for our adult students, it's it's been um, interesting. So we there's some lessons that we're trying to make sure we're paying attention to and learning from. And then um, the last thing I just wanted to let people know um, that we are planning a virtual graduation ceremony. Um, and I think it's going to be, we're really trying to find ways to have it be very honoring and very celebratory but also um, in a safe environment. So one of the things that we've done um, is we are going to, um, it's, it's totally virtual, but we are gonna launch it on the same day and same time as our graduation would be. So on Saturday, June 5th, we are gonna encourage um, graduates to get together with their families and they can watch it then. Of course, it'll be available anytime after that, but we will, we will um, launch it on Saturday, June 5th at two o'clock. So um, we look forward to that. And I have, I wanna give a nod to NVU. We have, um, NVU did a really wonderful um, virtual ceremony and um, their folks have been um, working with our folks in terms of giving some good pointers, things to learn. You know, it's, you know one of the things we're finding out is it's a lot of work to launch a really good virtual ceremony, because if you want to make it personal, there's one thing just to put up, you know, a 20 minute thing, but to make students feel like they're really honored um, is very interesting. And the other thing we're going to be monitoring closely is, you know, normally at a CCB graduation, uh, we usually get, oh, maybe um, always more than half, never more than three quarters of our graduates attending. It'll be quite interesting to see if we get more engagement with all of our students um, throughout the state by doing something virtual. And so then if we do, how do we make sure we think about that in the future? Never to replace our face-to-face -face graduation, but is there some other thing that we also need to do? Um, and the final thing I will just say um, as another lesson, um, we did our student orientation. I think I might've shared this at, at a committee meeting. We've been doing um, our student orientations now virtually. We did um, them in the fall and we did them in the spring. And um, we did three this past spring and we had over a hundred students at each of the, each of the online um, orientations. And so we had between 300 and 400 new students go through our orientation. And in a good year, when we did our face-to-face -face ones, we would not have had that number spread out over 12 centers. So there's some things that, you know, we need to be paying attention to as we move forward. I don't think people, people are gonna, behaviors are gonna be completely different. And um, so how do we, how do we um, 
capitalize on that and be attentive to it. So I'll stop there. And if there's any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions, Bill? Just uh, quickly, are the uh, presentations about uh, Abnaki people of Vermont, are they recorded and can they be accessed yes. subsequently? Just so yes, clear, yes, I, I they're, they're all recorded. would love to access that even if they're not, weren't able to join you virtually. Thank you. Yes, and you know what, Bill, I will, I'll send you a link there. It's on our website, but you're welcome. I'll, I'll send you a link directly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, I, I would just put in a plug. I just did the one with Don Stevens, Chief Don Stevens last week. It was it was great. It was so informative, really enjoyable. So it's an hour. It's definitely worth people spending time on it. Karen. Uh, <clears throat> likewise, I was able to, to attend uh, Chief Stevens' presentation. And I would tell you that as um, I, I grew up in Swanton, educated in Swanton all my childhood, that's my hometown. And there's a very strong Abnaki presence in the Swanton, Highgate, that general area. And I was always aware of it growing up. And um, it's, it's a different subset of Abnaki than, than Chief Stevens. But I learned, I, I learned a whole lot uh, listening to him. And um, I had made mention to some, some people in our system when the whole issue of diversity came up. I said, you know, there are going to be people of color, visible color, who sit near someone and think that they're sitting near a person, you know, all the new sociological terms, white privilege, ad nauseum, okay? Not knowing that the person they're sitting next to has, has um, Indian, maybe French Canadian culture, you talk about intersectionality of, of a legacy of suffering. And these were the people, while there weren't many blacks in the state of Vermont to target for the KKK, these were in fact the primary targets of the KKK and I could go on and on. But there is there's a lot of um, generational suffering that's not easily recognizable from a cultural and religious and ethnic standpoint that I think we in Vermont and we in higher education need to be mindful of as we talk about diversity. So I'm going to that's another conversation for another time. Um, but I wanted to make that point. But I think this is wonderful, Joyce, absolutely wonderful. And that's a very rich part of our heritage that needs to be acknowledged. Anyone else have any comments about CCB? Thank you. OK. Um, next on the list, Castleton University. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, I'd like to take two minutes to give you brief updates on enrollment and uh, COVID and NECHI. First enrollment, uh, against all expectations, our enrollment this spring keeps going up. Uh, thanks to our very hardworking and creative and flexible admissions team, our FTE enrollment now stands at almost 1,800. Wow. That's down just 100 compared to last spring before the pandemic. It's quite remarkable. Uh, and by the way, if you look at head count, our spring head count is 2,400. That's actually one of the highest we've ever had. I think it's due primarily to our talented team at the Caston Center for Schools. Mm -hmm. the Center for Schools provides professional development to Vermont's educators, uh, teachers, principals, other administrators. It's a shining example of how the VSCS can provide workforce development that directly improves the state's professional infrastructure. That's the spring. Uh, similarly, enrollment for the fall is also looking very good. Uh, even though on-campus recruiting visits are down almost 100% for obvious reasons, uh, applications for the fall are up 20%. Uh, 
compared to last year. Acceptances are up 26%, which is important because it shows that these are quality applications. Now, because I never feel comfortable being completely optimistic in the bad news category, we are seeing an uptick in positive tests for the coronavirus. We haven't talked about the pandemic a lot today. Um, uh, it's not over. And um, our uptick mirrors the experience of some other colleges and uh, towns in Vermont. Uh, and it does coincide, as you know, with the arrival of the new, more transmissible strains of the virus. It may also reflect some extracurricular activity on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, I don't wanna exaggerate the situation. The number of our cases is still uh, in the single digits, but we're, we're keeping an eye on it. Um, I will say, despite the recent activity, overall, we are having a safe semester. We're in constant contact with the Department of Health and uh, the experts there confirm that our protocols uh, are uh, robust and are working. Um, I guess I'd like to highlight in this connection, not just the expertise of the Department of Health and the excellent, excellent leadership of our governor, but also the unprecedented communication and cooperation between the VSCS and AVIC. That's the Association of uh, Vermont Independent Colleges, Middlebury, St. Mike's, Bennington, Norwich, and so forth. Um, if you don't know, you should know that the higher ed community in Vermont has uh, come together as never before this year. And it's, uh, I think, an under-publicized but crucial reason why we are all weathering the storm. Uh, number three, finally, it gives me great pleasure to announce that Nechi, our creditor, just completed its year-long review of our new locations at Killington and at Bennington. And we passed with flying colors. Bennington is where we opened a branch of our nursing program last year. And it's also where we are currently exploring some very fruitful synergies with VTC's nursing program. So uh, Bill Lippert, stay tuned for, I think, positive news uh, in the months to come about that. Um, and Killington, oh my gosh, Killington is the site of our program in resort and hospitality management. It's a great program where the students earn their degrees in just three years while living and working up at the Killington Resort. So they earn money to pay for their education while getting their education. And when they graduate, they have a 99% placement rate in the resort industry. Um, the leaders of that program testified last month before the House Tourism Caucus. Mm -hmm. And the legislators, I think, were, I know, were very impressed and agreed that the Killington program really could be a model for workforce development in Vermont. So there, I ended optimistically. I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Jonathan Spiro at Castleton? Congratulations. Those are nice things to hear. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, I um, I have spoken to people, we've heard from a lot of people in the hospitality industry um, because this has been one of the most highly impacted areas in the state during this COVID uh, situation. Um, I'm glad that the students at the Killington program are both able to continue to do the program and continue to get jobs. I know I've talked to people previous to COVID who really wanted to go and get these resorts. And we're looking for people to work in these resorts, which have a variety of, of job opportunities, career opportunities, and they really were trying to emphasize that we could do more. And so the Killington program, I think, is a, is a real bellwether of what we want to try to continue to do. So thank you. And, and I, I mentioned the governor and the Department of Health, Mike Salamano, the leader of Killington and PICO, just done an amazing job job keeping those resorts open and thriving and safe. Yes, thank and, you. Uh, you know, just this impossible year. So yeah. not a great leadership. Okay, we now have uh, any questions for uh, the Castleton University presentation. Okay, we'll move on to Northern Vermont University, Elaine Collins. 
morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to give you a brief update. Uh, so our numbers also at Northern Vermont University, we've seen a lot of great interest and uh, in a record number of accepts. So we're looking forward to our, our fall semester. Spring semester was also a very strong semester for us. I reported that in our last uh, report. Uh, regarding COVID, we have conducted 6,061 tests and had seven positives across two campuses. I think that it reflects our students really uh, buckling down on our processes and procedures, the good work of our staff. Uh, we're still optimistic that we are going to end the semester with very low numbers. And I, th I think it speaks to um, all of the great work that's happening on campus. We are successfully offering and continue to offer face-to-face -face courses. Um, and while keeping these numbers low, and again, I think that speaks of uh, volumes for the work that our staff and students are doing and everyone is doing. Um, I think post COVID as I think about it and the delivery, I think that we've learned a lot, faculty have learned a lot, we've all learned a lot regarding uh, remote delivery. And I, I'm looking forward to see uh, what we are going to carry forward after this is all over. Uh, meanwhile, we have greatly expanded our access to events, performances, and lectures. And I think during a COVID time, it's really important to uh, make sure that our community is uh, also taken care of. And we have, through our two theaters, new increased live stream capability. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Another success which I thought was kind of interesting. I think it's my Greek heritage uh, driving my interest in this, in this topic, which is food, all right? In terms of our dining services, um, Sodexo just gave us a report that across the nation, uh, the average in terms of student satisfaction with dining, their dining services is 75.4. Both of our campuses scored uh, in the 90s in terms of dining satisfaction, 92.4 and 93.2. So that's just amazing um, and, and speaks to the great work of our um, Sodexo staff, Tom, Mike, Kip, and the NVU team as well. Uh, a little bit on strategic planning. And you know, speaking as a commissioner on, on the NETCHI Commission, it's been interesting throughout this COVID time to see that many schools have not been able to make great progress on their strategic planning initiatives. And so it's typical, you know, if they're saying we don't have any staff, so therefore we've put all of our goals on hold. I hear that quite a lot of times. In contrast, we've been able to push our goals forward. And I think the good work of our provost, uh, Nolan Atkins for helping with this. Uh, we have now completed or put in progress 85% of that strategic plan. And just a couple of highlights that I think are just really uh, noteworthy. First is that we have completely launched now our Center for Teaching and Learning. We've hired a specialist in professional development to kind of help faculty through this new period uh, in terms of teaching remotely. We have made serious advances in our social justice related work. I think Pat is one of these advances to just all the fine work she's doing that I spoke to earlier, but also uh, two other faculty have reviewed all syllabi at NVU with an eye towards social justice. They have, uh, they're writing a paper or they have written a paper on their findings and they will be working with faculty so that we can ensure that all of our classes uh, have a lens in this uh, important area. We've also spent a great time increasing our internal and external communications through e-newsletters, uh, just to make sure that all our stakeholders are always informed and that everything that is happening at NVU is, um, is transparent. In terms of our learning and working community, we have pushed forward uh, with the posting for a learning and working coordinator of partnership engagement and workforce development. Uh, we have, that has been posted. We are now in preliminary rounds of interviews and have found several very uh, highly skilled candidates and are looking forward to finish that particular search. I mentioned that I'd share just a little bit more about cultural activities. 
Again, I'm hoping that you can even uh, watch along with us. All of our events are live streamed. We have a special site set up. It's NVU Performance YouTube channel, and you can find it at northernvermont.edu backslash performances. Again, it's northernvermont.edu backslash performances. So just this week, we hosted a uh, jazz trio earlier in March. We hosted Susanna Davis. She is the first executive director of racial equity in Vermont. And that was extraordinarily uh, a, a very great performance. Um, additionally, in April, we have a Vermont Comedy Hour. We have the Abby Sherman Rock Band, Craftsbury Chamber Players, uh, master classes that you can take. And we also have uh, Dr. Nicholas Rio. He's a citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. He's also associate professor of Native American and Environmental Studies at Dartmouth. And he'll be uh, presenting a lecture as well. And you can follow along with us. Uh, some other information related to um, what I've been up to recently, I've spent a great deal of time speaking to a large number of different groups, both internal and external, on um, my kind of understanding of where we're going and also uh, the, the um, advantages of moving in line with the NCHEMS proposal. We've had a lot of great questions, a lot of great discussions, but I really feel that it's important to bring our community along uh, as all of these important discussions are happening all around us. So, so that's been taking a lot of our time or my time. Uh, also virtual commencement. Uh, we are planning a virtual commencement. We're also planning, you know, I've heard a lot about identity and maintaining um, identity. So, you know, thinking about all the wonderful traditions that we have at our Lyndon and Johnson campuses, we are now planning um, an honors convocation at Johnson and a virtual robing ceremony at Linden. These are all virtual, but they still, even in COVID times, we've been able to maintain the identity of each of these campuses and the wonderful trends, uh, traditions that people look forward to. Uh, and I think that's a plus. In terms of athletics, I do have just a couple of things that I wanted to share first. And, and uh, this is a special, a special accomplishment. Linden Hornet men's coach Dave Pasiak uh, did score his 300th career win, and it happened when the Hornets defeated the Norwich Cadets, I love saying that, uh, 99 to 83 on March 6th. Finally, at Johnson, uh, we have completed a, an NVU Johnson Wellness Suite campaign it involved 109 donors from 17 different states. It was a $500,000 campaign and the wellness suite is now uh, in use. Finally, we had a 2021 support your sport campaign and we are not a 79 uh, percent through the goal of 30,000 with four days remaining on that particular campaign. And I know that um, Nolan would be unhappy with me if I didn't mention that uh, we finally submitted the EDA grant for nursing. Really looking forward to uh, hearing back from the grantors. Uh, we did receive a $50,000 pledge that we have been using uh, as a matching fund for the EDA grant and additional 30,000 of that being used toward the needed equipment for the lab. So uh, looking forward to hopefully giving you some good news about that very soon. And that would conclude my report. Uh, be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for President Collins? Again, it sounds exhausting. That sounds very good. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I'm not hearing any. We'll go on to President Pat Moulton of VTC. Good afternoon, Lynn and, and other members, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. I too would like to update you on a few things. First is how is our spring semester going? And so far, so good. Um, as you're aware, we did have one incidence of so positive test amongst the residential student as a result of our surveillance testing. That resulted in quarantining five students and the one positive in isolation. 
I'm pleased to say all remained asymptomatic throughout the period of quarantine and isolation, and they have well been released. Um, we are also continuing our surveillance testing of all our students, residential and commuting students. Um, we're also fortunate to be hosting every Thursday here in Randolph Center, a vaccine clinic held by the Vermont Department of Health. And that means uh, it's much more accessible as various bands of eligibility are opened up. So that's working out well. Students will finish their semester here on campus on a Friday, April 16th, and then they'll have a break week of April 19th and then complete the semester remotely from home and not return to campus after the week of April 19th. So we are um, in the, the last few weeks and holding and hoping everything remains smooth. We too are planning a virtual commencement this year. We wanna make it a lot more personal than the virtual we did last year. And I also would like to say great thanks to NVU and, and the work that they've done. We too are working with NVU to try to make this a more personalized uh, virtual commencement this year. We also will be having a virtual convocation um, honors uh, for our honor students. Once again, not happy we have to do it virtual, but better to do something than nothing. For fall 21, we are planning to be full steam ahead, opening as normal as the protocols will let us. We wanna have as many heads and beds and full classrooms and labs as we can possibly have. Uh, vaccination is going to be the key to that, and we're strongly encouraging our students to get vaccinated as a means to have the most normal college experience they could otherwise have. Uh, we are going to ask an optional question of our students of whether or not they've been vaccinated, and we'll see where the law goes in terms of those requests. I'm also pleased to say our enrollment is looking pretty good for the fall. Uh, we had a fantastic enrollment year, fall of 19, so it's a little hard to beat that, but our current deposits are exceeding last fall and exceeding our five-year average uh, for the fall, so we're pretty happy that that's happening. Um, I also want to update you on the construction of our new additive lab here on our Randolph Center campus. This is our $12 million expansion and innovation around additive manufacturing. We had a lot of work to do to get ready for construction. We had to move our IT department to new headquarters and that is complete, newly renovated space for them. We have an entirely new data center that Kelly Campbell gets all excited about. It's what makes IT people happy, but I'm excited about it too because we were able to purchase with the DOD money um, an entirely new set of updated servers and to accommodate additional equipment which will help the new servers will help us accommodate the additive equipment, but also keep our existing IT moving, for, uh, moving smoothly. Construction has started and it will include a new HVAC system on the, new, on the first floor of Morrill Hall. And we're gonna be replacing the current wet sprinkler system with an argon gas fire suppression system, which is far more palatable to the type of machinery should, God forbid, we have an accident. Um, and of course, there'll be installation of equipment that we're ordering. We have, we've been working with additive subject matter experts with America Makes, which is a fender, federally funded national accelerator for additive manufacturing working across the country to try to entice more additive work, particularly in the area of defense. Those consultants have proved invaluable to us uh, as we look to outfit our lab. We're also in the process of hiring a lab director and very pleased that we have a number of good candidates, including some folks here in Vermont. I'm also pleased to say we are moving forward with our sale and right sizing. We have a contracts for the sale of the Enterprise Center in hand, signed, ready to go. That's great. We also have a contract to sell the house adjacent to the Norwich Farms facility and we're excited about that. Um, actually an offer above asking price, um, sight unseen, which seems to be characteristic of the market in Vermont these, these days. We also have several parties that are looking at the six acre parcel with the dairy processing lab, the four bedroom house, the barns, et cetera, that we refer to as Norwich Farm. Um, also and our transformation at Vermont Tech, we have been very busy. We have five very active charter groups working on those five charters around transformation. This work will really position us well for unification, so we're pretty excited about it. Just to refresh your memory, the five charters are one physical plant really looking at right-sizing the Randolph campus. Uh, that includes starting a master planning process that is presently underway 
and looking at permanent work from home options and shared offices to another, another means of shrinking our footprint and minimizing the, the property that we're maintaining. A second charter is reviewing all of our academic programs, looking at how to reinvent some of the lower enrolled programs or possibly discontinue and how can we enhance um, the uh, uh, remaining programs. But at this point, that work is ongoing. We had been coordinating with RPK and will continue to do that as appropriate. The third charter is looking at non-traditional delivery. This looks at how can we best deliver our comprehensive applied education programs through remote delivery, such as low residency and or decent decentralized delivery, possibly partnering with career and tech ed centers. I'm pleased to say our School of Engineering and Computing is ready starting this fall to offer their 1000 level courses, both synchronously and asynchronously as a means of trying to attract non-traditional students into that program. We've got a lot of work to do in that way, in that, that realm, but we're, we're making progress. The fourth charter is looking at enhanced enrollment pathways, looking at how to grow pathways from career and tech ed, high school, and also CCD and our other sister colleges. And the fifth charter is a business analysis charter, which has really two parts. First is an in-depth analysis of all our business and operational functions of the college, similar to to some of the work we're doing around program review. We wanna apply some of that same financial analysis and qualitative analysis to all our other business operations. And the second part is a comprehensive look at different pricing models for our programs. And that would likely be done in conjunction with the system as we look at unification, but we think that's an important analysis to be done doing. And last but not least, and not really a charter, is our ag and food systems transformation planning. We're really getting down to the nitty gritty and the analysis of the curriculum and programs that we've had subcommittees working on. And we've had continue to have the 45 folks who God bless them, volunteer their amazing amounts of time to work on this. Uh, these are subject matter ex experts around ag and agricultural education who've been working up with us for nine months. And I, I just, I don't know how to thank these people enough because they take time out of their very busy days to devote solely to Vermont Tech. We hope to come and give a presentation about that outcome in the near future as we finish our financial analysis and, and get the board up to speed of what that ag and food system transformation looks like. So with that, I too am happy to answer any questions anybody might have about my presentation or anything else going on at Vermont Tech. Any questions for President Moulton? Okay, we look forward to that presentation from the ag uh, transformation that you're going to do. Anything thank else? Much. Beg your pardon? Just thank you very much for your time. Yes, thank you all of you. Um, we now are going to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is a um, executive session. Uh, do we have a motion? Do you have that, Megan? I do have that. Okay, I move the Board of Trustees enter executive session pursuant to 1VSA 313A1A to discuss contracts, 1VSA 313A1B to discuss labor relations agreements with employees, 1VSA 313-1AE to discuss pending or probable civil litigation to which the VSC is or may be a party, and 1VSA 313-A1F for the purpose of receiving confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services. Because premature general public knowledge of these discussions would place VSC at a substantial disadvantage, it is appropriate for the committee to enter executive session. Along with the members of the board present at this meeting, in its discretion, the board invites the chancellor and the general counsel to attend. No formal or binding action shall be taken in the executive session. We have a motion on the table. Do we hear a second? Second from Linda Mill. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion as stated to move into executive session, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no one's opposed. Let's move into executive session. We will be out of this as soon as we can. One, two, three, four, five, 
six, seven, 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 seven. Do we have everybody here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. I count eight. Is that a quorum? Anyone? Two. Yes, it is. I think, I think you have nine. Oh. Megan's back. Yeah. Okay. We think we have nine. It's a quorum. Okay. Okay. Um, it's now a little after one eleven, and we are back out of executive session. We do have uh, some motions that need to be made. We have um, we have a a agreement that's been negotiated for the um, one of the unions. I'm going to ask uh, the chancellor or the general counsel to explain what that is, what that what that group is, briefly. But we have a motion. Uh, we can have a motion on the table for accepting that agreement that is now going to be ratified by the board. Uh, Patty, do you want to do I that? Move, I move that we um, ratify the um, labor contract, the ratified labor contract, ratified by the labor union that Pat's about to ex explain to us. I Perfect. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Patty, you want to explain who this group is so we have an idea of what's going on with it. Absolutely. It's the PAT SUB SUP unit, which means the professional, administrative, technical, and supervisory employees. So it's two it's two separate units, but the, we've historically we've negotiated the contracts together. So we sort of refer to them as PAT SUP. It is Technically, two separate contracts, but the, the language is more or less identical in both. Okay. And Beth is the president. I see Beth is, <laughs> has appeared. Okay. So we have a motion on the table. Anyone have any questions on this ratification of this contract? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor of ratifying the uh, this new contract, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Uh, seeing none, we have now ratified the uh, the PUT PAT SUP contract. We also have um, some guiding principles that we uh, that we have got for future negotiations. As a board, we made a resolution that said we wanted to do this. These are general uh, guiding principles. Um, would anyone like to make a motion on that? Oh, Mary. Mary, okay. A second? John. Okay, Sean. Okay, so we have a motion. Um, um, the chancellor or the general counsel, would you like to um, go over briefly what those are? This is... Certainly. Would you like me to, Sophie? That would be good. That would be fine. And we can, I mean, these can be included in the meeting materials too. They'll be publicly available. So they'll be, yes. yeah. That's right. So the statement, these are guiding principles for labor relations. Vermont State Colleges respect the rights of employees to seek representation by a labor union as provided in the Vermont State Employees Labor Relations Act. Trustees and management of the VSCF are committed to working collaboratively and in good faith with all union representatives in support of Vermont public post-secondary education that is affordable, accessible, high quality, and relevant. In our labor relations, we are guided by the following principles. Students and their success are our singular goal. To focus on student success, we will foster a workplace that provides education for life and a lifetime, be responsible stewards of our fiscal resources, be a leader in our Vermont communities, collaborate with our workforce for effective and efficient operations, make well-informed decisions based on objective data, metrics, and evidence, and seek to continuously improve the delivery of education for the benefit of Vermont. Okay, are there any questions or concerns about that? Okay, 
Hearing none, all those in favor of the... I don't think you have a motion. Do we have yeah, a motion? Yeah, we did. We, we did? did? I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. yes, and a second, Sean seconded it. Yes. So we have the motion on the table. Um, all those in favor of... Uh, Karen, do you want to speak? No, I just want to vote. I've got to, <laughs> I've got to leave. Aye. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, now we have, um, we're coming to the end here, folks. Uh, we have additional business. Is there any additional business that anyone has? Seeing none, we do have a comment from the public. Uh, anyone who wants to comment from the public, this is the opportunity. I Karen don't Hickson, we did not have anybody sign up for this. Okay, I don't see any hands. Okay, so the next thing would be to have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Mary. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All right, all, any discussion? All those in favor of adjournment, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Thanks to everybody. Lynn, you did a great job. And thanks Lynn, to all terrific. the members Thank for you all again. Be well, everybody. Right. Thank, Thank you, you very much, everyone. I appreciate all your hard work and your time. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.